borrow money at the prevailing rate when we borrow new money, and that will reflect the Bank of England's uh, interest rates um, uh, at the time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Alan Brown. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, Ms. Alistair, what, what's Thames Water's debt and how much has been paid in dividends since privatisation? So, um, current level of net debt is £14 billion. Pounds. That compares to a regulated capital value, the value of the business, of £19 billion, pounds, which gives you the 77% gearing rate. Um, in total, um, dividends that have left the company since privatisation is about £3 billion. Pounds. If you compare that to how much equity investment that's, um, been, that has been already put into the business and or will be put into the business as part of this equity support package, that's about £4 billion. Pounds. So in essence, the current set of shareholders have, who haven't taken any dividend at all um, will be committing the best part of 14, £4 billion pounds of equity to this business. Of much higher figures in dividends, is that £4 billion robust? But even then, that's £4 billion that's paid to shareholders that could have been invested elsewhere, surely? Indeed, but we're investing um, almost a record £1.8 this last year. We will maintain those record levels of, of investment going forward. And in fact, we fully expect investment levels to have to increase in the next price control as we, uh, uh, as we in, in seek to in, improve asset resilience, but also just improve just, I can, Is that dividends to external shareholders or to actual um, the, the sort of core investors in the company we're talking about. Um, that was total dividends to, right. to, to um, uh, so last year, for example, we paid £45 million pounds to, to service debt um, at, uh, the, at the, the ultimate holding company. But to be absolutely clear, our shareholders, our current shareholders, have taken no dividends since 2017. By the way, in your figures, roughly 33% of the debt equates to dividends. Sorry? Roughly 33% of your debt is equivalent to dividends that's been paid out. In, in, in that simple mass, absolutely. That's correct. Okay. Can I ask about Thames Sideway? How is that funded? That's funded by an entirely different regulatory um, price control. Um, it's not funded by Thames. It's, it's a different company that's independent of Thames. And does, does Thames investors get any returns from Thames Tideway? Uh, not directly. Okay. Um, it's also underpinned by the regulatory asset base model. How much cheaper has that made that? Because that's also underpinned by the UK wide uh, exchequer. Oh, is your question? Well, Thames Tideway, the, the infrastructure is funded under a regulated asset base model, which is risk sharing with the UK taxpayer. How much of our benefit does that bring? That, as I understand it, um, helped reduce the cost of funding of that project. How much? I, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask Tideway. What was the original estimate for Thames Tideway and what was the current construction estimate? As I say, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask because it's an entirely independent company. Okay. I don't think I'm getting any more there, Chair. So. Uh, thank you very much. If we could just move on to Philip Dunn, who chairs the Environmental Audit Select Committee, who's been very involved in water quality, particularly in our rivers. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to touch a bit on some of the regulatory challenges that the company faces. Uh, I think, Mr Cochrane, you became Finance Director after the record fine of £20 million in 2017 for sewage leakage, and then the pay repayment to customers of £120 million for uh, water supply leakage problems. Um, but you were in post last week when the company was again fined over £3 million by Offwatt for uh, deliberately misleading Offwatt, uh, according to the, the citation. Is there a culture of ignoring regulatory requirements in the company? Shall I pick that up? Absolutely. Would you mind? Um, yes, so... Is that, you're, yes, you're, there is a culture. Oh. <laughs> yes, you're going to answer the question. Up. Yes, I'm going to pick, that, pick up your question and answer it. So, <laughs> you're right. So, last week we had the decision from the judge in the Crawley prosecution case. Um, that case dates back to 2017. Uh, so it, it is rather rather historical in, in nature. Um, there is no doubt that we caused a, a serious pollution incident in the Crawley stream. We, we've apologised unreservedly uh, for that. 
Um, the judge in that case did find uh, that we had deliberately misled the Environment Agency. Um, I have been through the case file, I've read everything, I, I don't see that, but obviously we completely respect the judge's decision. In terms of your point on culture, I think one of the things that we've done over the past couple of years, particularly under Sarah's leadership, has been to really change the values and behaviours and the culture across the company. I think historically we were a company in which bad news travelled upwards too slowly. Uh, I think people were afraid actually to say how things really were on the ground. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, that we've achieved actually over the past couple of years has really been to turn that around and it's really helping us uh, to be honest actually within the company about the challenges that we face so that we can really address them and, and make improvements. Are you included uh, within the companies being investigated yes. by Offwater and Environment Agency for breaches of licensing for sewage yeah. discharges? Yeah. And how many cases are being investigated at the moment? Well, at the moment we've got two large investigations. So we've got one uh, being conducted by the Environment Agency in relation to compliance with flow to treatment. Uh, and then we've got another one being conducted by Offwatt uh, on the same issue. Uh, and I believe Offwatt is also contemplating whether we're in breach of Section 94 of the Water Industry Act, which is obviously the provision uh, of effectual drainage. Um, they are considering multiple instances under that broad heading, but there are just those two investigations. Offwater have indicated with the Environment Agency they're looking at over 2,000 breaches across the industry. Uh, can you indicate to the committee what proportion of that if you haven't got a specific number? Yeah, I don't have the specific number with me. I, I mean, I certainly think that Thames would represent a large proportion uh, of that. We have been very open and transparent about the extent to which we are discharging untreated sewage into rivers. We've also said that that is unacceptable uh, and we've been fully cooperative with the investigations that are being run both by Offwort and the Environment Agency. Uh, final question for me, Chair. The uh, Government have announced today that the, they're removing uh, the cap on fines for breaches of licence permits. Um, what, have you made any assessment yet of what you think that might mean for Thames Water in the event that these investigations lead to fines? We, we haven't assessed the, the impact of that particular change, no. I mean, the, the one thing that I would say, though, is that, although I can understand why the government is doing what it's doing, um, we are committed to becoming more compliant with this legislation. We're committed to delivering better against the expectations of the public in respect of river health. Um, and almost regardless of the level of financial penalties, we would stay committed uh, to those goals because it's simply the right thing to do and that's what the public expect. This is a culture change that we can look to for the future. Would Alistair, I assume you endorse? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that you know, respecting our environmental obligations, uh, respecting our obligations regarding drinking water, these are the fundamental bedrocks on which a successful company culture is, is based. And actually, I think one of the, one of the important sort of contributory factors is the culture of the people at the coalface. Uh, it's probably mixing my metaphors. Um, and I, I think when you talk to, I started to talk to people on the ground, uh, they are very committed to customer service. And they are the best advocates for the business. We must empower them and let them do their business going forward. Could the witnesses to speak up? Thank you, Chair. Could the to speak up a little, please? I'm uh, being asked. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, I think, going back to what you said about it was it was a leak at near Gatwick, wasn't it, yeah. where lots of fish were killed? I, and I, I've read some of the, and it was it was a genuine either mistake or a, a technical fault that caused the problem. The, the, the problem was the, the cover up afterwards. And, and I think um, the, the the judge, Christine Lang Casey, said she believed, and I quote. There would have been a deliberate attempt to mislead the Environment Agency by omitting water readings and submitting a report to the regulator denying, denying responsibility. Are, are you saying you, you, you don't agree with that? You said it was, what was it, accidental? It wasn't deliberate, it was accidental that, that the, the misleading readings were given and, and the uh, responsibility was denied? Let me, let me recap and, and, and first let me say I'm, I absolutely accept the judges decision. There's no equivocation with, with, with the judge's findings. But what happened in that case was that we had uh, two pumps uh, working to pump sewage in, in the sewage treatment works. And one of them uh, started to work constantly 
to pump sewage directly from uh, where the sewage came yeah, in. into the stormwater in, tank. In, We're not denying that, that, that there was a technical yeah. fault. It, yeah. it was the, the, the cover-up, which I think the judge was drawing attention to, yeah, and the, um, the attempt to mislead Offwat about what actually had happened. Yeah, I mean, t to, to clarify, it was the Environment Agency rather, rather than Offwat, but the, 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 point, yeah, sorry, the point still yeah. stands. So what happened was we, we actually conducted two separate investigations into what happened following this malfunction of a, of a pump. <laughs> um, one of those investigations concluded that there were multiple factors that could have contributed uh, to the pollution incident and it wasn't clear that it was our error. Mm -hmm. And a different investigation conducted by a different team concluded that it was in fact to do with an error that was made by Thames Water not to sort out the, the malfunctioning pump. Those two investigations happened in parallel. They were conducted by separate teams. Those teams did not talk to each other. When we were asked to submit our investigation to the Environment Agency, the investigation that got submitted was in fact the one that had said that uh, it wasn't our fault. Um, in fact, what should have happened is that we should have sent both of those investigations and all the underlying data to the, to the Environment Agency, which in due course we then did. Right. Um, but of course it transpired that what appeared, if, if you were looking at this from the Environment Agency's point of view, is that Thames Water had said that it wasn't its fault when it knew that it was its fault. And I can see how that, how that comes across. I can absolutely see that, how that comes across. Uh, I, I, think it was, um, I think it was an error on our part rather than a deliberate uh, intention to mislead, but I completely respect the findings of the judge. So, so I just uh, add one code of that. Uh, it's very early days for me. I've been in the chair for two days. Um, but I've got a lot of experience of dealing with other utilities. And I think the change... Uh, could you speak up, please? I'm sorry. The change that needs to occur within Thames is to treat all our regulators as partners. We must have an open book basis with the regulators. We must treat them as people who have the interests of the industry and actually of Thames' customers at heart and just help them by being very transparent in what we do. That is the tone, I think, that we need to set from the top. Okay, thank you. Barry Gardner. Yes. Um, Mr. Cochran, you've painted, to my colleagues, a very uh, good picture of the, the, the state of the company at the moment. But in May of this year, JP Morgan's report said it had poor financial performance. You've been the finance director, finance officer for uh, since 2021. Weak operational performance, a stretched balance sheet. Uh, it talked about the enforcement cases coming from off what. And, uh, uh, portended stricter off what dividend policy coming in the future. Um, 151 of your staff you've now chosen to make redundant. That was on the 20th of June, just a month after that report. Are they paying the price for your failure? I think we have been very clear, uh, indeed, on, on Monday when we released our results, that our operational and financial performance wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, we've been very transparent about that. We know we need to improve performance for our customers. You haven't been transparent about that for the past two years, have you, since you've been financial director? Let, let's look at the, the figure that you discussed with my colleague earlier, £14 billion pounds of debt. Um, I think actually note 18 of your account shows that your borrowings are £15.7 billion. How does that reconcile with the £14 billion that you were talking about earlier? So fourteen billion, just to be absolutely clear, is our statutory measure of net debt. Net debt. Um, it for covenant calculation purposes, which is what we report in terms of gearing, it's fourteen point seven billion. And that takes account of um, what is called debt accretion, the additional costs for hedging, inflation and other risks. Um, oh, that was fourteen point five, isn't it? Fourteen point seven. I thought 14.5 takes the form of your whole business securitization, a structure that you've used uh, to borrow against your highly regulated assets. So a net debt on a covenant basis is 14.7. Um, that, as I say, compares so to get to the 77 cent of gearing, which is the lowest level of gearing in the, lo in the last decade that we announced this week. <laughs> Sorry, the lowest level of gearing in the last decade that you've announced, but the second highest in the sector. Indeed, but yeah, yeah, indeed. And the off, off what when you were regulating off what or controlling off what, Ms. Ross, um, I thought you said that the, the uh, ratio should be 60%. <coughs> Not 
not 77, not 80. Is that not the case? You said it should be 60%? Well, the 60% gearing that we were using when I was at Offwatt, and in fact Offwatt's been using um, right up until the last price review, is the notional level of gearing that Offwatt uses to input into the formula that it uses to determine the weighted average cost of capital. So did you recommend 60%? Yes, you did, didn't you? No, we were using a 60% assumption for the purposes of calculating the weighted average cost of capital in a price control. So you weren't concerned at all that at that period the company had over 80%? Our view at the time, and I, I, I will fully acknowledge that views have moved on, but our view at the time was that a company's choice of capital structure was a matter for the company itself and that the shareholders bore the risk of that. Now obviously views have moved on since then, <coughs> was the view at the time. Right. So now that the views have moved on, what discussions have you had with the government on the potential nationalisation of your company? None. None. Why do you think it's being talked about in the press so freely? Well, I can say that over the last couple of weeks I've read a lot uh, in the press. Uh, some of that was rather more uh, outlandish uh, than perhaps uh, we would have liked. I think well, one of the things that may be outlandish, maybe Mr Cochrane can come to this, is the way in which you structured, uh, what was it, £560 million pounds of debt just in the case that the government should have to take over the company. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. Uh, which debt are you referring to? Uh, this is the, the amount of money that would be payable from your debt uh, should the government, the government would have to pay £560 million pounds off to your, your, share, your debtors? Um, I, I, I don't recognise that figure. But, um, don't. I think what Barry is referring to is, is when um, Mr Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party and there were manifesto commitments to... I think I'll say it in my own words, Chair. Thank okay, you Barry. very much. Okay. Um, there was... Uh, talk about the nationalisation of the water company at that time. Um, but actually, since then, it, public opinion's moved on. Public opinion has actually gone from 79% of people opposed to, to nationalisation now to 83 because of the way in which your companies have been failing um, to, to meet the public's expectations. Um, so nationalisation uh, seems to be a pretty popular thing amongst the public, uh, and maybe that's referenced in the press. Um, but my question is about uh, the way in which you included a clause in a previous debt issue that would require the government to immediately pay off around half a billion pounds of debt in the case of nationalisation. You don't recognise that clause? Don't recognise that clause, no. Okay, in that case perhaps you could... Sorry, Sir Adrian, you, you seem to want to come in there. I was going to address the question of nationalisation very well, briefly. Okay, if, if we can just finish, finish off with Mr Cochrane first. Um, if you could write to us, to tell us, in fact, was such a clause included in a previous debt issue? If it was, why was it? And what would the implications of that have been for the, uh, for the government? Thank you very much. We'll do that. Yes, Sir Adrian. Um, I was going to address your question on nationalisation. If, if you go back the very dawn of the private ownership of these utilities, the rationale was to empower the utilities to borrow privately, to use private sector capabilities <coughs> and performance through the uh, yeah, operation of the utilities. We say that we have much more to do in that area. But I think the key thing is remove from the Treasury the burden of funding the improvements to the water sector that we are now managing privately. And uh, that was the driver of privatisation. But the, the problem, Sir Adrian, has been that actually, the, although there has been substantial investment in the infrastructure uh, since privatisation, I absolutely agree with you on that, it hasn't been enough, has it? And that's exactly the point of my colleague Mr Dunn's questions to, to your colleague earlier. And indeed, we've got to increase the flow of that investment. That's what our refinancing package is aiming to do. But what your structure, the structure of the company, not when you were there, Sir Adrian, but what the structure of the company allowed was for an Australian bank to actually uh, leverage uh, the fact that your regulated asset to extract money out. Did it not? Yes, I think that there was yes. a, a flow of dividends mm -hmm. from the company under previous ownership. It, it's for us quite a long time ago, Mr Gardner. 
Uh, I think it reflected slightly... It different. reflects the state of the company do now, doesn't it, Sir Andrew? It reflects, I think, the state of what the markets were and the practices at that time. Um, I can't... I can't. Those practices can't, are still going on, aren't they? I can't... Quarry's correct. doing the same in other regulated industries. And actually, you yourself, I believe, uh, are on one of Macquarie's companies, Cadent, and, and, and actually Catherine Ross um, is on British Gas Transmission, aren't you? National Gas Transmission. Na National Gas Transmission, which are both Macquarie companies. No, so not, it does seem that there, there's a very cosy arrangement here. I have to correct you, Mr Gardner. They are not Macquarie companies. They have a range of international investors in them, including, in my case, Chinese and Qatari investors. Um, they're all very responsible investors. They're all seeking to perform, improve the performance of the companies. That is the case here. It was probably the case when Macquarie owned a major stake in the company. I can't answer to that myself. But this was ancient history, relatively speaking, ancient history for us, because Macquarie exited in 2017. Well, you and I have a different definition of ancient, Sir Adrian. Thank you, Ben. Reflects my back. age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rosie, I think you wanted to come in with a supplementary on that yeah, question. Thank you very much, Chair. Just following on from uh, Barry Gardner's question, 278,418 people have now signed the petition to bring water companies back into national ownership, and I helped some of my constituents deliver that to Downing Street around Christmas last year because it was started by a group in my constituency. Just leaving aside, you know, the idea that you don't think that that would work, because obviously you don't, um, do you understand why the public would like to see our government or whoever being responsible for the water company so that everything's transparent? It's not as though we can shop around as customers. It's a vital utility. We don't know who all these investors are from foreign companies that own our utilities. Can you understand, any of you or all of you, why the public want transparency so we don't have to do inquiries like this? I think that um, public ownership uh, seems to be the answer to many questions. Mm. I think when you conduct a real evaluation, I think private ownership is still the way forward. I mean, that's a personal belief. I've been associated with private sector operations all my life. I can understand the frustration of customers who want to see improvements. Uh, we would love to be able to deliver all those improvements overnight, but it will take time. We will try very hard to bring the customers with us. Uh, our frontline employees serve customers every day. Uh, they're very much in touch with everything that happens on the ground. We also need to be in touch with things that happen on the ground. And we've got to improve our standing with customers. We're absolutely agreed on that. But I think the way is continuing the private sector model, not reverting to the public sector. That will be my instinct. OK, I mean, on the ground in Whitstable, in my constituency, there's lots of poo and sewage, so it'd be nice to improve that. Anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, the, the only thing I, I would add is, is there is a, obviously a, a perfectly reasonable uh, national policy debate about ownership models. Uh, I think that's perfectly legitimate. That's absolutely normal uh, in, a, in a democracy. Um, our job at, at Thames, and this is what Adrian was talking about, is, is to keep the taps flowing and the loose flushing and to improve our performance I, under whatever model uh, the government of the day decides, and that's what we'll keep focusing on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rosie. Derek Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Catherine, we've just heard your Chairman talk about wanting a closer relationship or partnership, as we used, between Thames Water and Offwat. You are a previous Chief Executive. <coughs> does the, so does the relationship that is aspired to, this partnership, and does the trend of Offwat staff seeking high-pay positions in industry affect the ability to regulate water companies? Yeah, so the first thing, just to be really clear on, which I, I, I'm sure you, you know, is uh, I left Offwat in January 2018. I, I went to work for BT uh, for three and a half years before I then applied for the role at, at Thames Water. So there was quite a gap between me leaving Offwat and, and joining Thames, which is quite important. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I think that there is uh, an important role for better understanding between companies and the regulator about what each is trying to achieve and about how the, how the regime works. I mean, I, I'm immensely proud of my time at Offwat. I think Offwat people do an incredibly difficult job every day. They're very passionate about the water sector and wanting to deliver for customers. Um, and I think for me to come into a water company and a water company which is facing very considerable challenges and a massive turnaround, 
but bringing that understanding of what the regulator is trying to achieve, which is actually you know, very much in common with what we're trying to do at Thames, uh, is, 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 is helpful, and I think that mutual understanding is, is, is beneficial. Thank you for that. Um, so while you were chief, chief exec, you delivered a strategy on building trust and confidence in water services. Has that been delivered? <laughs> it's a work in progress. <laughs> Um, and so I'm a West Cornwall MP, so you might understand why I asked that question. What was your view on um, Macquarie's approach to Thames Water while you were CEO of Offwap between 2013? We've covered it briefly, but in terms of their relationship and their, the, bit, the way they've got up debt, was that a concern when you were chief exec? Yeah, it's so let me, let me just sort of go back to, 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 to that time, which, which, as I said before, does feel like quite a different world, actually. I think things have moved on a, a lot. Right. So when I, when I joined Offwap, um, as I said before, it, the, 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 the zeitgeist at the time was very much that decisions around capital structure were a matter for companies and their investors, and their investors were on risk uh, for that, um, and that as a regulator, um, we would keep a weather eye on things, uh, and we would be ready to act, but only when acting was really necessary. So things like uh, the requirement in licenses to maintain an investment grade credit rating was, was really important. But beyond that, if a company chose to gear up, essentially its equity was bearing more risk and that was a choice for its equity. Um, now I think, you know, even as I was sort of leaving off what, sort of 2017-ish and then after I left in 2018, uh, I think views moved on quite considerably, and as you've seen in more recent years, off what's taken a keener interest uh, in what it calls financial resilience, uh, which is a broader concept, and then as part of that uh, in capital structures that then culminated in more recent license modifications. So given that financial resistance and the extraordinary pressure on Thames Water today, do you expect or intend to increase customer bills in the near future? Well, in the near future, not. So uh, we're currently in, in the current price control uh, settlement that was uh, established by Offwort in 2019. So Offwort can't reopen that, uh, and so those price limits will hold uh, until 2024. So we, we remain restricted by the PR19. That's just next year, though. Until, yeah, exactly. Now, beyond then, uh, and I think we, we've already talked about this, there is no doubt, and Thames is not alone here, there is no doubt that there is a substantial need for more investment in the sector as a whole, including in Thames. Uh, and we've said repeatedly we have an ageing asset base. Uh, we have assets that aren't as resilient as our customers and the environment would expect them to be. We also have a lot of new infrastructure that we need to invest in to meet the challenges of climate change adaptation um, and, and population change. Um, and so that, that will need to be funded. And, and it is an unfortunate truth uh, that the only source of ultimate funding for that in the current model is the customer. Now, the really important thing is that we as a water company are as efficient as we possibly can be so that a customer does not pay a pound more than they need to. Uh, but it's also important, uh, our previous conversation, that we can access capital markets so that we can finance that investment and smooth the cost over decades rather than uh, basically having to uh, recover all of that cost in, let's say, a five-year period, in which case the bills will be substantially higher. And so, Adrian, then, hearing all that and understanding that at the moment, if you were to put prices up, the customers would feel they're just paying for the failure of Thames Water, potentially. The work you need to do between now and next year, are you, you, uh, how, how are you going to approach that to restore trust so that when people's bills increase, potentially, that actually they recognise it's to pay for the service they receive, not the way the companies run? I think there are two elements to this. We must deliver on our promises. We must be much better at communicating with customers. It's a long, hard road, but that's what we will have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we uh, ask Darren to come in? As cha he's chair of the uh, Business and Energy Committee, so we're pleased to have you as our guest. Thank you, Sir Robert. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Catherine Ross, in 2014, as the chief executive of the water regulator, you signed off the business plans for the water companies, didn't you? I did. And you just said that at that time you thought it was okay for those companies to increase their debts because it was their risk. Is that right? Yep. What would have happened at that time if any of the water companies went bankrupt? Oh gosh, right. So just, let's just take a step back. Um, and if you could ask my question, if a company during the time when you were CEO went bust, yeah. what would have happened? Yeah. So what would have happened in the event of, of a bankruptcy or insolvency is that the special administration regime that's set out in the legislative framework would, would kick in. 
that is a decision for the Secretary of State. I mean, when I was at Ofwat, our expectation would have been that we would advise on that, uh, but it would, it would have been a decision, as I think it still is, for the Secretary of State. In plain English, that means that it would have had to be nationalised and taxpayers would have had to pick up the bill. That's right, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily. No. A special, special administrative regime, either you sell the business to someone else as a going concern, as we've seen in the failure of the energy market, or the government has to pick up the bill, as it had to do with bulb energy. So ultimately, the taxpayer would have been on the hook, wouldn't they? Well, in the event that the company uh, couldn't be sold as a going concern, uh, yes, there would be some liabilities that would have to be met, and they could be met by the taxpayer, or they could be passed on to future depending on the regulatory regime at the time. Right. We're here today because Thames Water, which you now run, is in a position where the government is having to plan to renationalise you because of a failure of your finances. But you signed off as the chief executive of the regulator in 2014 for Macquarie to ramp up the debt from £3 billion to £10 billion while taking out nearly £3 billion in dividends, often paying dividends higher than the profits the company made in particular years. The reason we're in this position and the reason that taxpayers are now potentially on the hook for billions and billions of pounds of national borrowing is because you as the chief executive of the regulator and the regulator failed in delivering your statutory duties. Do you want to apologise to the public, Ms Ross? Well, I don't accept that characterisation of Ofwat's price control in, in 2014. The other thing I would say as well is special administration is obviously uh, a matter for the government, but special administration is very much a nuclear option. There is a very, very high bar uh, on the government deciding to put a company into special administration. And one of those uh, triggers would be insolvency, and the other one would be uh, you know, perhaps a persistent and severe breach of our licence. Uh, now, we are not close to either of those two triggers, and you heard uh, our CFO uh, talking a little while ago about the fact, about the fact that we have £4.4 billion pounds of liquidity. We are a long way off uh, that insolvency trigger, and I think a long way off the conditions for special administration being met. Okay. Could, I, could I just add something? Because, yeah. When I'm ready, Sir Adrian, sorry, forgive me. Um, so, Ms Ross, you just said in the 2014 price review you didn't accept that characterisation, but you've just admitted to the committee that you signed off the business plans that allowed Macquarie to increase the debt, which has got Thames Water into the position it's, it's been in. The regulator facilitated this problem, didn't it? Let me, let me clarify. So, in 2014, uh, the Ofwat board, not just the Ofwat chief executive, uh, issues, issued a set of final determinations. That, that, that is correct. What those final determinations actually did was set out what the company needed to deliver for its customers and the environment, and also the amount of money that they could recover from their customers to do that. That is all they did. And then, of course, the incentive uh, framework that Ofwat puts around that determines the amount of money that the company actually makes. Now, Ofwat policy at that time, which has moved on, but Ofwat policy at that time was that if a company made a profit under that regu regulatory regime, it was up to the company to decide what it did with that. So if it chose to pay that profit out of the company uh, in distributions, uh, it was free to do that. Um, uh, Ms Ross, uh, let me ask the question in a different way. Uh, two of the statutory obligations of Ofwat, the regu regu water regulator when it was set up, was one, to protect the interests of customers, and two, to make sure the privatised water companies could finance themselves. On both of those measures, are you seriously telling the committee today that you as the Chief Executive of the Regulator at the time succeeded in delivering those statutory obligations in the context that you're before the committee today? Are you really saying that was a, su a success? I think at the time when I was at Offwort, and I believe it to be true today, everybody at Offwort takes their statutory duties incredibly seriously. What did you perform them? We were exercising our functions in pursuit of our statutory duties. Whether every decision we made was perfect with the benefit of hindsight, <coughs> possibly not. But that's exactly what we were trying to with, do. With the benefit of hindsight, would you like to apologise to the taxpayer for being here and put, potentially putting them in this position where, yet again, another regulated market could potentially collapse and expose taxpayers to billions of pounds? I think if you're asking for an apology from Offwort, I think you should... Asking for an apology from you, Ms Ross? No, I, w I, w I won't apologise for my role as the chief executive as, as Offwort, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I think Barry wanted to come in with another yes, quick point. Yes, just on the, the question that my colleagues just raised. Um, if you go through special administration, then, of course, the shareholders take the hit if the company isn't financially viable. And that's, that's what shareholders are for. And that, of course, relates to the 560 million question earlier. Um, but the process need not be renationalisation as such. You could actually set up regional local authority bodies to take over and transfer the company as a going concern 
to those regional local authorities, could you not? I think that would be possible, yes. And, and, and actually, that is the way in which many countries in the rest of the world actually run their water industry, isn't it? I mean, there is, as I said before, there is, there is a perfectly reasonable debate to be had about the right structure and ownership uh, yeah, the, model. The, the question sector. was simple. It was, that is the way that many other countries in the world run their water industry, is it not? Yes, there are a variety of models, and that's one of them. And, and, and they do it, actually, more successfully in many cases than we happen to have done, don't they? Can't comment on that. Well, in, in terms of the, the questions that my colleague Philip Dunn put to you earlier. Um, I haven't got the comparative information about the performance of different regimes. Finished. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just a couple of final questions. Um, obviously, um, you've got very high levels of gearing, as we've already mentioned. And, but you just talked about you know, long-term investment and how you're looking at decades ahead. So do you think it was a mistake by the company to have so much of it debt, if, if it's debt, about 50%, actually linked to inflation, rather than taking out more long-term deals, given it's such a long-term business? And was that done maybe because... Um, the people lending to the company were so closely connected to the company, and I, I know you've sort of referred to that, but you know, is, is it the case that actually the shareholders cope without a dividend because they're getting these interest payments in many cases? Well, we manage our balance sheet to, to, to reflect the, the period in which we're investing in. So we have debt that's up to 40 years in tenor. The average age is at 13. Um, critically, um, the shareholders have put in additional equity to ensure we retain that strong balance sheet so that we continue to be able to borrow money at a efficient rate of interest um, and do so your, to your credit ratings of bonds of late haven't they the, the we still retain an investment grade credit rating a triple b credit rating which is a strong investment grade rating that allows us to borrow money efficiently and therefore we keep customer bills down Okay, thank you. I think Alan Brown wanted to come in with a quick point. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Just think about Alistair at the outset when I asked you about dividends. Um, we've got a briefing, and if you look at Thames uh, Utilities, Thames Water Utilities um, accounts, it shows that cumulative dividends paid out was $7.2 So why did you give a much lower figure? Let me provide you the analysis um, after this committee. Yeah, that would be very good. Thank you. Finally, Can I just ask yes, please, Philip, really quickly yeah. on that specific point. It would be very helpful if you could, in your uh, reply on, on dividend payments, separate those which are payments to equity shareholders and those which are characterised as dividends in the accounts but actually are, repay are within the financing structure funding debt payments. Because yeah. thinking that the, the, the statement about uh, not our, our shareholders haven't taken a dividend. It was only referring to the the normal shareholders, not the debt finances. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. They have, they haven't taken any income for their investments, yeah. right? And Mr. Ross, having been both involved with Offwat and obviously with Thames Water, do you think the remit of Offwat could be extended to look maybe a little more deeply into the sort of the financing structures within water companies rather than just sort of the relationship between the the sort of provider and the, and the, and the customer to, to get a bit better picture of just where that debt is and, and how exposed you might be because obviously I don't think um, most people were aware that you were so exposed to high inflation in, in terms of your debt repayments. Um, in terms of Offwatt's remit, I mean I think that's exactly what Offwatt's been doing in, in recent years. I mean you can ask them more about it because that's mm. carried on after, after I left. But, but certainly from about 2017, if I'm recalling, certainly through 2018 and more recently, they have been paying a lot more attention to what, what they refer to as financial resilience. And part of that is, is about gearing and the appropriateness of the capital structure for the sort of investment programmes that are needed. And I think that's entirely appropriate. Okay, thank you. And just before we let you go, you, um, Mr. Cocking, you talked about 151 redundancies. Are those going to be voluntary redundancies? Could you give an assurance? Because obviously there will be people working in the company who will be worried about their jobs and their future. Will there be compulsory redundancies, or do you, are you confident you can fill those redundancies <coughs> with uh, either early retirement or voluntary redundancies? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't announced a redundancy programme. Right. I think the figure I saw was 151 redundancies. As I say, to the best of my knowledge, we have not announced 
a redundancy program. In fact, we have been hiring people consistently. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, uh, for example, we onshored our client service, our customer service facing team into the region as part of our turnaround plan and continue to in-source activity so that we can get an operational grip on our business to help part of this turnaround. See Barry's champion Mr. Cochrane, why when I mentioned that earlier, did you not immediately say that? I'm, I, I'm astonished. I'm, I'm delighted to be you, able to You missed the now. point when we talked about it earlier? Missed that part of the question, I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, we, we put the record straight. So, yeah. can I, Sorry, Chair, if, if I may, just, just one further thing. Uh, and that is, given that um, inflation is going to rise and your, your uh, interest on your debt is going to rise, um, is it the case that prices are going to go up for customers? Indeed, under the regulatory model, um, prices are um, indexed to inflation. So why is it that you and others, uh, indeed in offer, have, and indeed in government, have been saying that there is no possibility that bill payers will see their bills rise? I think if anybody's said that, um, that is not... It's a government that. minister, actually, I think, as well. No, I mean, the, the, <coughs> the regulatory settlements are done on a CPIH plus... It, well, indeed, yes. Yeah. We all know your interest payments are going to go up. This is what's precipitated the problem. Yeah, but I, so, so the question is, how much are they going to go up? What do you actually foresee the rise that, that your customers are going to have to pay as a result of your company's failure? Actually, our customers are paying less than they otherwise would as a result of the poor operational performance of the business because we are in penalty territory uh, in terms of off what's incentive regime. Now, that means that the penalties we pay actually translate into lower bills than would otherwise be the case for customers because we're not delivering the service. So we want companies to fail in order that bill payers don't pay as much. Is that what you're saying? No, but the view is that customers should pay for the service that they receive. We haven't been providing the level of service that customers expect, and therefore we shouldn't charge them uh, the prices that we would otherwise have charged them. We're talking about the interest payments on your debt leading through to a rise in the bills that your customers will pay. Is that the case? No. 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 There is no mechanism within the current price control <laughs> to enable us to put up bills to reflect <coughs> higher interest payments. <coughs> and, and so your bill payers can rest assured on the assurance of the co-chief executive of the company that uh, uh, the financial difficulties that you've got yourselves into will not result in their bills rising. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed for uh, coming and giving us evidence. We'll now move on to our second panel. Thank you very much indeed to our witnesses. Thank you. <coughs> suspended. The proceeding is currently 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 suspended. Welcome to our uh, second uh, evidence uh, panel from uh, Off Wet. Uh, off what? Uh, could I actually Off Wet as well, probably? But uh, could I uh, ask my the witnesses to introduce themselves? Ian, I know from my time at the Department for Transport, of course. So uh, welcome and nice to see you again. So could you just introduce yourselves briefly, please? Well, so, um, Ian Coucher, I'm the chair of Off What. I've been there since um, this time last year, so 12 months. Uh, David Black, chief executive at Off What. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I ask Robbie Moore to start the questioning, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. If I said that Offwatt is the economic regulator of water and wastewater sectors in England and Wales, would I be correct? Yes, that's right. 
So how can I, or indeed any members of the committee sat around here, or indeed my constituents, have any confidence in Ofwat uh, when on the 29th of June you express confidence in Thames Water's financial situation, yet Thames Water's debt burden is 20% above your recommended level? So Yes, so uh, as, as the economic regulator, we set a, uh, an amount of debt uh, level in terms of when we set price controls as what a reasonable, prudent company should have. However, companies have discretion uh, to, to manage their own financial affairs, and so companies make decisions about the choices they make in terms of debt levels. What we do as a regulator is to protect customers' interests by ensuring that they do not bear the consequences of companies' decision-making. Uh, and what we've done in the last uh, two years is to is to very much strengthen the provisions around companies having adequate financial resilience. And so our concern is making sure companies have sufficient buffer to deal with uncertainty, to deal with events that may materialise, uh, and that's exactly what we have done. And so we have protected customers' interests, customers uh, protected in terms of the bills they pay and the services they receive, and they will remain so. And do, so do you think that you've acted reasonably and responsibly and quickly enough within uh, the situation that we're seeing with Thames Water at the moment? So Thames Water are responsible uh, and their shareholders are responsible uh, for, for their level of debt uh, and we are holding them to account on behalf of customers. But how are you holding them to account if we're in this situation that we are at the moment? What action have you taken so far? Can I just say a few words? Um, <clears throat> so the situation in which Thames finds itself is a consequence of its underperformance. Um, so it's got high levels of gearing. Um, we would like to see the gearing levels down because it does provide, as, as David says, a, a greater buffer when things go wrong. So Thames, these problems at the moment are being crystallised because they've got underperformance, so they are not getting the revenue they expect because they're delivering poor service to the customers. So the revenues are down and their costs are higher. So the shareholders are now bearing the, the extra cost, um, which means because of the lack of resilience in the company, which we are concerned about, it now needs injection of shareholder funds. So, so our concern is performance. They are in the situation because performance is not where it needs to be, and we've got similar issues in other companies, but at Thames, their performance is bad. So we have been all over them in addressing their issues about turnaround, improvement, customer services, and costs. So, so when you say you've been all over them, why did you on the 29th of June express uh, confidence in their financial position? We're only in July now, that was only last month. We are confident that, that in the conversations we've had, they have got sufficient equity commitment coming from the shareholders to address their shortfalls. So we, we, in the short term, believe that the right course of action at this point in time, because they haven't got financial resilience, is the shareholders to inject equity to support the, uh, the business as it stands okay. today. So off what express confidence in Thames Water's financial position on the 29th of June. We're now in July. You are here recognising that they have got challenges now with their financial position. Um, Thames Water has raised 750 million of the 1 billion it requires. You've mentioned short term there. What is the impact going to be on customers, on my constituents and indeed constituents of those sat around the table here? Before, I come, before we respond to that, I think we should make very clear that in December last year we published a report saying we were unhappy with Thames' financial resilience and that action was required. At that time, the company had committed to £1.5 billion of equity injections and on that basis, uh, we, so that was the basis, uh, that, that was our view at that time. But it hasn't so, raised so it's, that it's, a level it's, of funding, it's though, not, has It's it? not that on 29th of June we've suddenly changed our position. We were very clear and have been clear for some time yes. that Thames has inadequate financial resilience and that they need to address that. Okay. So just to be clear on that. Okay, and so over that time frame... Thames hasn't raised that level of funding, is that, is that correct? Uh, so they've injected the £500 million uh, as they committed to uh, uh, as um, recently, uh, yeah. and it was the remaining billion pounds which they have now uh, reached uh, agreement with the shareholders to support a £750 million pound injection of the company. So that's the change, and that was our concern and why we were engaging with the company ahead of their financial reports about the shareholders' commitment uh, and those are the discussions that we've been having with the company. Do you feel as a regulator that you've taken sufficient enough action despite having first raised it in December and not giving as, as stark a warning as I would like to see from a regulator on the 29th of June? I think our, our warning in December last year was unambiguous and clear that they had insufficient Do you feel results. as a regulator that you've taken sufficient enough action since the warning that was put out in December last year? Yes, uh, but we were also engaged before that. We were having discussions. I've just uh, 
shortly after I was appointed as acting chief executive, I was discussing with the chief exec, then chief executive Thames Water about their about our concerns about their financial resilience, and it was those con and and in terms of we have an annual process where we look at the company's assurance around their adequacy of financial resources and about how the company was going to demonstrate uh, that, and that was. The outcome of those conversations were the company's commitment to inject the £1.5 billion into the business. So we've been engaged with Thames on their financial resilience for some time. The shareholders are responding, uh, but we are, remain concerned that there are significant issues to address, and as Ian said, significant performance issues in terms of the turnaround of the company. So how are you as a regulator going to ensure that that, cha that challenge is addressed and their debt burden is going to be brought down? So in terms of, the first thing is for the company is to get a plan that will secure their, their, their turnaround. So they've obviously made a number of attempts to turn around their business. Uh, those haven't succeeded at this point, uh, and we continue to hold the company to account on their performance to date, and so imposing financial penalties on, on the company uh, for their failures to deliver for, for customers. Uh, we uh, have, so we have a number of license powers, but we have powers, uh, for example, in terms of the, the payment of dividends, which we've just uh, brought brought into, into place, uh, but we also will examine their assurances around their financial resilience, which they have provided to us on this past Monday, uh, and we'll work through that and engage uh, with the company. Uh, we re will remain in discussion with, company, with the company about their ability to secure financing from shelves. So, I mean, my, one of my concerns is that ultimately, as a result of Thames's poor management, this is likely to result in customer bills going up. No. I can be unequivocal on that. So uh, we set uh, companies allowed uh, cost of capital, allowed returns on the basis of an efficient, well-functioning company. So Thames shareholders uh, are up for the additional costs associated with their poor performance, and that is evidenced by the fact that they've had to inject additional funding into the company, uh, and they've uh, had very little in the way of dividend payments over the last seven years. So you, you were very quick to come out with a no there, but over what time period does that relate to? Uh, so, in terms of we reset price reviews every five years, but the key point is we're saying that we will allow Thames the efficient costs of running the business. Now, that may vary, and it, we, we will set that again as part of the 2024 uh, price review. So, you can only confidently say no up until 2024, is that correct? Or not beyond all, that? Not at all, because we have a policy position. So, whether bills are going up or bills are going down, that will be determined by the needs from a customer and an environmental perspective, uh, and we'll set bills on the basis of Thames as efficient costs and an efficient cost of financing. Uh, that, uh, and so that will be the basis for uh, setting bills, uh, and it won't be about Thames' actual debt burden or actual costs of debt. Thames customers do not pay a penny more for Thames' 80% gearing versus other companies' 60% gearing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. John Jones. Um, thank you. Last year, my committee did a major inquiry into the collapse of the energy market and highlighted a number of failings at the energy regulator Ofgem, which they're now dealing with. Have you been working with Ofgem to learn the lessons from the energy market as it relates to the water market? Uh, yes, uh, we, we welcome your report and we have uh, considered it. Uh, we've also engaged with Ofgem and their advisors they engaged with during that process. So, for example, we had the, uh, the consultancy they commissioned to do the independent review come in and speak to our senior leadership team and talk through their view about the lessons learned uh, for Ofgem. Okay, so having considered my committee's report, what do you think the main takeaway is that you need to now change it off what to secure the future of the water industry? So we, we think the key changes we have made are the, are the bringing into being of new conditions and company licenses around payment of dividends and financial resilience. So under the Environment Act 2021, we received new powers to amend company licenses. Up until that point, we didn't, in our view, have sufficient power to change company licenses. We have now used those powers. The first target of our use of those powers uh, was around strengthening provisions on financial resilience. Uh, the second change we're making is about improving customer protection and customer service. In 2022, uh, Ofwat started financial monitoring of water companies, uh, according to the review of your uh, 2014 price review that was published on your website. Were you not doing this before? Uh, so we've published a financial monitoring report since 2016. Uh, so we've published a series of reports every year. Uh, they come out, we look at companies' financial statements they provide to us. We do our analysis on a range of, uh, of, of financing issues around companies, including their, their debt structures, their dividend payments. Uh, and their plans for <coughs> equity, uh, and, we've pump, and so we've been doing that since 2016. And did you raise issues about Thames Water in 2016? Uh, so we identified that they had uh, high levels of gearing, that they had uh, financial ratios that, that uh, did, did raise concerns. Why has nothing happened about that? Uh, so 
Thames have been able to, to finance their activities, and so there hasn't been a, so there, so we have been engaging with the company, and we have raised concerns about it, uh, but frankly our concerns at the time were more focused on Southern Water, where we have secured injections of equity into that company, and Yorkshire Water, we have also secured equity injections <coughs> in that company. Uh, we have now uh, more focused on Thames, uh, recognising the issues that they're facing. But at the time, those issues were less severe uh, than faced by the, uh, the companies I've just named. Shouldn't you be focusing on all of the companies you regulate, not yes. just one at any given time? Uh, we, we do, but the point I was making is that we were engaged with uh, the shareholders of Southern at that time to, uh, uh, in terms of securing their exit from the business and the entry into that business of new shareholders who were able to inject a billion pounds into Southern Water. In the previous panel, the new chairman of Thames Water said that we need to enter a period of transparency where the water companies are transparent with the regulator. The implication of that is that they haven't been in the past. Is that right? Uh, they have provided information to us on their financing. I think what I would say is they weren't sufficiently transparent with the public. Uh, obviously, company financing issues are complex. We have criticised them for being opaque. We have introduced licence conditions to require companies to provide more adequate financial information. But I think there's a huge challenge for companies in like, explaining in plain English what's going on with the financing structures, where the money's coming from and where it's going to. I think you said uh, that from 2025 you're going to reduce the debt target from 60% to 55%, is that right? As part of the price review, yes, we use a notional uh, gearing target and that is the signal that we think there should be prudent headroom in financing structures. Uh, so, we would, so we're using that to signal to investors and to companies uh, that we think their equity buffer needs to increase as they face the challenges of the future. They're going to be making large investment programmes, they're facing the challenges of climate change uh, and we're also increasing the level of financial penalties on companies uh, so we want them to have adequate financial structures to bear that. Only three of the 11 water companies that you regulate have debt below 60% today. What is the consequence if they don't hit your debt target from 2025? And so what we're concerned about is adequacy of financial resilience. And so that doesn't rest on gearing alone. So I think we need to be quite clear that the gearing number is useful. It's, Sorry, could it's, you try that in just plain English for me? Yeah, Forgive me. Sure. So what happens if they don't hit your debt target? What's the consequence for the company? So the, the, we're not setting a target in terms of companies. To, Why do you to call achieve? it a debt target if it's not a target? Because that's the basis for setting the price review, which is about making sure we're protecting customers' interests. So customers are paying a bill based on a 55% gearing target uh, rather than the actual gearing the company has, which relates to the question earlier about how we protect customers' interests. So we're saying that we're going to set customer bills on this basis. If companies have different financing structures, they bear those consequences. So this is, it's really important that shareholders and companies are responsible for their financial structures. We are here to protect customers' interests, and that's what we're doing. My last question is on consequences. You've made the point repeatedly that you protect customers and you've talked about customer bill bills. <coughs> you recognise, though, do you, that there is a scenario in which the taxpayer would have to pick up the cost of a failed water company because they are too important to fail. Do you ever think about the risk to taxpayers of bankrupt water companies when you're looking at protecting consumer interests? I think you're referring to the special administration regime. So the situation in water, as with other regulated industries, is that a special administrator will be appointed if a company is in danger of insolvency. Uh, it is their job uh, then to deliver services to customers, to protect customers' interests, but also to secure new owners for the companies. Uh, and in contrast, perhaps, to the energy companies you looked at, water companies have very large asset bases. And so in the first instance, we think costs around special administration will be borne by investors. Uh, we do accept that there is a risk for taxpayers, uh, and so that is one of the reasons why we've been working to drive increased financial resilience into companies. What we've used our new powers we've received under the Environment Act uh, to change license conditions to tighten up on financial resilience. The public will look at what's being reported as happening in the water industry, having just gone through what happened in the energy industry last year. And the risk here is that the government taxpayers have to borrow enormous amounts of money to underwrite the risks that companies have been allowed to take. And the public will see, once again, companies like Macquarie cashing out, walking away with their money, the previous CEO of the regulator refusing to apologise for the fact that we're in this position in the first place. And the public will say, what are the consequences? Who is responsible for exposing taxpayers in this way? Do you, albeit as the newer chief executive of the water regulator, want to apologise on behalf of your predecessors for ending up in this position in the first place? 
so just in terms of, I think it's very, uh, we need to be careful about the parallel with the energy sector. And so, as I've explained, the energy companies which failed had very little in the way of assets. We're talking about, a, in the Thames case, a 19 billion pound company. And so the question is, can the equity holders or if needs must debt holders bear the consequences of Mr. that? Mr. Black, a taxpayer and a customer is the same person. It's still a person paying out money either to the government or to a company. My question was whether you recognise the failure of the water regulator over these many years that's got us into this position in the first place, and whether now as the chief executive of the water regulator, much like the chief executive of the energy regulator did last year, you want to apologise for the public for the position we're in today. We continue to protect customers' interests. Customers, we are not in a position of either Thames being in special administration. Uh, you think everything's okay right now? Is no, that what I you're don't. saying? I think there are some very serious issues that Thames Water need to address. But my point is that customers' interests remain, remain protected uh, uh, by the regime. Uh, we're not at the point uh, where, as I've been very clear, that customers are, are having to pay any more for Thames' uh, financial issues or for their poor performance, and that remains so. And as I've explained, the situation in energy is different from water, uh, as in water companies have much greater capacity uh, to absorb the consequences, or should I say their shareholders. I understand. You've made the point, Mr. Black. Just very lastly, because I'm going to be testing the patience of uh, the chair. I'm a very patient person. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I'll keep going in that case. Um, uh, do you therefore not have a request of the government to enhance or extend your powers? Because it seems to me that both you, Mr. Black, and your predecessor, Ms. Ross, in the previous panel have said to us, it's up to the companies how they run their businesses. And don't worry, because if it goes wrong, the government's probably not going to have to nationalise it anyway. That's not what it looks like from, from where I'm sitting. So I would want you and the other regulators to be in a position where when you're regulating a company that is too important to fail, you actually know what's going on in that business and you have the power to make sure they don't end up in a position like they're in now. So do you need additional powers from the government to do that job properly? So I agree that uh, the issues you're raising are very serious and I agree that up until 2021 we didn't feel we had sufficient powers to address those issues. So the crucial change for us in 2021 was our ability to amend company licences and so the licences instrument we use to regulate companies. We now think we have sufficient flexibility in terms of amending licences, both in terms of the changes we have already made, but if we think further changes are required to go ahead and make those changes. Uh, so we think the government has now given us uh, the, the additional powers. And we've also received additional funding or the ability to raise additional funding so we can resource up to, uh, to exercise those, those new powers. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Cat Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Black, earlier in response to a question from my colleague Mr Jones there, you did say that the water companies were being uh, transparent with yourselves as the regulator, but not necessarily with their customers. I'm just wondering, I'm left wondering what on earth is the point of a regulator if then you're not communicating that with the public? Uh, so we think companies have a responsibility to communicate clearly with their customers, and so that was the question I was, resp I was responding to. We are able to get information from companies. We require them to provide annual, annual information to us of considerable detail. We also have a five-yearly business plan where they set out their five-yearly projections. Mr Black, I'm sorry, but, but if, if you know that companies are not being transparent with their customers and you know what's going on, why, why is off what not communicating that with them? We, would, we want companies to take responsibility for communicating to their customers. We, we have changed company licences to require them to, to, to do that. So we think that they are now uh, taking steps to, to, to do that. But the point I would make is that it is challenging to explain these issues to customers, and I think quite clearly customers do well, not feel that they steps, have sufficient information. Can, um, what, what is taking steps in that situation? So in terms of we can set guidelines in terms of what companies ought to be doing, in terms of what they publish. The guidelines are obviously optional then, yes? Uh, we also have requirements of what companies publish. What are the requirements? So the companies do publish annual financial statements. They do set out. Uh, so the question is not so much they set out the information. It is about communicating that in an understandable form to their customers. You so we think the information why, why is the public are kind of questioning what is the point of your organisation when it does appear that you have done absolutely nothing to inform them about some of the risks that these companies are taking. And I, I am left wondering whether or not this model that we have of water ownership in this country, which is completely out of step with what is probably the international norm here, is, is working because it strikes me that in 2017 the FT reported in a 10-year review of company accounts that on profits of £20.7 billion water companies paid an average tax rate of 8%. Who benefits from water privatisation? 
so in terms of since privatisation, 190 billion pounds have been invested. Uh, uh, so that and that has driven significant improvements in service, so improvements in water quality, uh, improvements, reductions in, in, in the levels of pollution, uh, and improvements in uh, customer service reductions and water supply interruptions. So there's water investment, uh, capital investment in the sector was about double at the rate pre-privatisation. So clearly the question about the ownership of companies is a matter for government, not for off watch. Uh, but we, you can point to tangible investments under the regulated model of more investment uh, and better service. Uh, that said, we're under no illusions. There are real problems for the sector to address. Uh, the situation on sewage spills and storm overflows is unacceptable. Uh, now that we have the information about those uh, discharges, action has been taken. But I should point out that these are issues that exist in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, there are problems in Scotland. There are problems in other countries as well. It does require a concerted effort to address. It will require more investments, uh, and we are, we are part of that process. We've had 34 years of water privatisation, and why is it that we're still talking about this desperate need for investment? If privatisation was meant to be the answer to this investment question 34 years ago, why, why are we still in this situation today? So is it because of the regulator or is it because of the water companies? Uh, so, I, so in terms of areas of where companies have fallen short of performance, so we've been very clear with the committee that we think the performance of Thames Water is poor, it needs to improve. There are other companies where we have concerns about as well. Uh, we think there are sector-wide issues uh, to, to address. Uh, but again, as I point out, if you look at other countries, other jurisdictions, they are facing the same challenges, issues of climate change, high-density urban areas, uh, addressing uh, uh, particularly with uh, older infrastructure issues about making the, uh, in terms of getting better performance that in line with what the public would expect. And so that we can point to significant investment since privatisation, we can point to significant improvements, but there's Why clearly Why is privatisation so unpopular? Whenever we see public polling on the idea of renationalisation of water companies, it's incredibly popular with the public. Why do you think that is? I don't think that's a question for, for me to answer. I think you, as an MP, will be much better placed than me to address that question. It's, is it because of the absolute utter failure of the water companies in England right now? Uh, so, we, we, just say, we can point to huge improvements in service, <coughs> huge levels of investment. But clearly, we accept the public is dissatisfied with companies. We've done some research which suggests that trust in companies have fallen over the last uh, three years. Uh, we think it's really important the sector address those issues. Ian and I called our company's chairs and chief executives in to, to really make the point that they need to improve performance. Uh, we are seeing signs of change in the water sector but much more change is needed. And this is not about who owns the companies, this is about companies uh, really adopting much more forward-looking management practices, so investing in smart grids, smart networks, should I say, smart metering, uh, using nature-based uh, solutions at scale, uh, and really modernising the way companies work. Uh, and we will continue to push the sector to, to do just that. Can I just say a couple of words, Kat? Um, it's a really good question about um, the prioritised water model. So it has been privatised for 30 odd years, £190 billion has gone into investment in the sector, that's four, five, six billion pounds a year. I, I, I would worry that in a nationalised situation that the call on that kind of investment wouldn't be there, so the money wouldn't be available, so it is going in. Why are we facing such an investment crisis now? Um, it's because the nature of the investment is changing, so we've got to address things like water resilience, we now need more water to cope with population growth, urbanisation. Um, climate change, there's changing standards on levels of water abstraction that the environment agencies are pushing through, the drive towards net zero and the need to address the stormwater overflow. So that is a very, very significant step of investment that we've not seen uh, in the past and that is causing some concerns about the future. Um, my, my final question, if I, if I may, Chair, is just about particularly about Thames Water. Um, can I ask what plans have been put in place uh, to prepare Thames Water for potential failure and what that might look like? Uh, so um, what we would call contingency planning for the failure of a water company is something we keep under review. Uh, and in terms of our concerns about Thames Water, we have been uh, looking very closely at the arrangements that need to be taken. Uh, and we are uh, confident that we can uh, rise to the contingencies uh, uh, that, that, that may occur. But we think it's prudent planning uh, to be ready for a special administration. Uh, but uh, as the company entered this morning, uh, they have sufficient liquidity to meet the challenges of the immediate future and shareholder commitment for additional funding. Uh, should those materialise, then obviously this planning won't be needed, but we think it's prudent as a regulator that we prepare for these outcomes, and we've been working on that. 
would you say you're confident that the special administration regime will not be needed in the case of Thames Water? Uh, I think uh, we, we need some rain ready to employ that. Uh, uh, if Do you think you'll be deploying it? Uh, I think at, at this point in time, the company is saying that they have secured commitments from their shareholders, and so believe them. It, so it won't be needed. Uh, um, obviously, so so in terms of, I think it's great that the company have secured the commitment from the shareholders, but clearly there is, uh, you know, the money has not yet arrived into the company, and so that at that point uh, we will uh, feel uh, more confident. Can I just 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 add a little tiny bit? One of the reasons we're doing a lot of contingency planning now is to learn the lessons of bulb. Um, you know, what that would mean um, is the most recent example of administration. So we're working with our colleagues across government to say, in the unlikely circumstances it happens, are we ready? Have we got everything in place? So we don't think it's likely at the moment for the reasons David said, but it would be sensible for everybody just to think about the possible implications. You do not think it's likely? At this point in time, we're confident the shareholders will inject some cash, but the problems at, at Thames are deep-rooted. And I start, I re repeat what I said before, the problems at Thames are a function of cost overruns and poor performance, and they need to fix that as quickly as possible, otherwise um, they will have the same problems in the future. Have you been asleep at the wheel as the regulator? No. Okay. Chair? Thank you. I think Darren wants to come in very quickly. A very quick follow-up. It's great to hear that you're uh, trying to learn the lessons from the bulb um, failure. One of the issues with the energy companies that collapsed last year was the capital that the Treasury had to provide to keep them running as going concerns. Uh, Bulb is, was huge for the energy market, but it's actually quite small compared to Thames Water. Mm. What's the assessment been for the Treasury in terms of the amount of capital it needs to put aside should Thames Water fail? Uh, so we've been working on those issues. I'm not going to name a number in terms of... Uh, in terms of where we're at in the, in the process, but as I've noted, there's quite big differences between Bulb, which is a relatively asset light company exposed to energy market fluctuations, and Thames, which has a large capital intensive business uh, with larger asset base and ability to raise funding. When, when the energy market failure was happening, both the regulator and the government wrote to my committee confidentially to tell us those numbers. Will you commit to do that to this committee? Uh, I think we'd probably refer that to Treasury. Those are questions for them, really. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, could you sort of give taxpayers an assurance that if there were to be a special administration, <coughs> this wouldn't be the taxpayer bailing out the shareholders? They would have already lost their shirts and it would be a case of picking up the pieces, more like the banks, I suspect, than the, than, than the energy companies. And that, um, who knows, you know, if, if the uh, company performed well, they could well be sold back into the private sector, as we've seen with some of the bank shares. Yeah, so the company would remain an attractive uh, interest for other potential in in investors. And so, as I say, they've got a £19 billion pound asset base. Uh, they have a secure revenue stream. Uh, so the question will be in terms of the interest of the existing shareholders. Uh, so they're the first in terms of their equities at risk. They're well aware of that. Mm. Uh, then there's a question about the debt holders in the company. Uh, might be the same people we heard in the first session. Uh, I don't think in the main that that is the case. Okay. Thank you. Barry. Yes, th thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, let, let me make it absolutely clear. I understand Ian, you came into the business only in July last year, and, and Mr. Black, you came in, I think, in April just before that. So um, you, you are left responding for things that happen broadly before your, uh, your tenure, and, and I just want to say we, we appreciate that. Um, if we go back, let's go back to um, 2003, South East Water. And you'll remember that Macquarie purchased South East Water then. Um, they sold it three years later for almost double what they purchased it for. And they had by that time increased the debt more than fourfold. Yeah. Um, in effect, they repeated that with Thames Water, or it was a much bigger prospect, Thames Water, um, and they increased the debt threefold there. Um, and instead of it being the case that companies raising debt in this way would, would use it to increase the infrastructure for the benefit of the public, the public good, they actually took 2.7 billion out of it and 2.2 billion of that was in loans. So you've rightly, and you've reiterated it to this committee, you, you've rightly said that you are 
were very concerned about the gearing, not only of, of uh, this company, but, but uh, of others in the sector. And the higher debt, that gearing, um, gives a notional lower cost of capital, of financing, doesn't it? Um, so lower charges then result in the short term. Um, but my accusation against Offward would be that you've basically over, you've encouraged over leveraging. And I have to say the two of you are not entirely innocent of this because, of course, in August of last year, after both of you came into post, um, you encouraged uh, the purchase by Macquarie um, of Southern Water. Now, you knew its track record. You know what this company does. You know it over leverages. You know that in the short term that can, can, can get charges down. But when it goes wrong and financing costs increase, we see the debacle that we've had uh, with Thames Water. So it seems to me that off what over a long period of time has been guilty of encouraging over leveraging and the immediate charge that I would lay at your two doors is that you did exactly the same thing just after you came into post with Southern Water. So just in terms of to contextualise, so going back to around early 2000, so the sector asset, so if we go, back, actually go right back to the start of privatisation, the sector asset base was £9 billion. It was fully financed by equity at that point. Today, the sector asset base is around £85 billion and debt levels are around £57 billion. So that growth on asset base of uh, 78, £77 billion since privatisation, £57 billion has been financed by debt and about £20 billion from equity. So when we look at the picture across the sector, debt has been a key source of finance, not the only source of finance. And that was intended at privatisation, so that debt levels would increase to fund I, the I don't growth want to overground where we agree. Yes. Yep. So <laughs> now can I move on overground to... Overground where we yes. disagree. So, yes, so now moving on to the, the cases that, that you've talked through in terms of... Um, it's a very uh, knowledgeable question in terms of South East Water and, and the Tem Macquarie's ownership of Thames. Uh, I would agree that Macquarie's ownership of Thames, that they, uh, you know, they did gear up the company to very high levels, they extracted that in form of dividends, and that's the reasons why we have changed the uh, licences um, once we've had the power to, to, to do so. However, we've been very clear that about the new basis and our new expectations of investors. So, and, and just coming to the specifics of Southern Water, Macquarie's injected a billion pounds into the Southern Water Group. They're now standing by to inject a further 500 million pounds. They have had very little in the way of dividends out of that company. So I take some sense of I take some satisfaction, and we've got new controls on dividends now, so they cannot get the money out of the business, uh, if, so we have the ability to intervene. So I, I take some satisfaction, actually, that Macquarie's, as an investor, are injecting money into the sector rather than taking it out of it, and we have the arrangements in place to protect customers' interests. Well, it goes back to um, your response to, to my colleague Darren Jones, doesn't it? That, that uh, actually, what is this target about you know, the, the gearing that you want? Um, if you can't enforce it. Um, what, what gives you the assurance that Macquarie are not going to do with Southern Water exactly what they did with Thames and exactly what they did with South East? I just say, the, the difference is the new financial resilience measures we put in place, which prevent companies taking, asset, um, taking dividends out of the company when they're poorly performing or when they're not justified. We didn't have that power before. <laughs> Sorry, and... I, I don't know the answer to this question. That, that's rare when I well, ask what a question. question is very no, up. no, it's not. <laughs> I assure you it's not, Chair. <laughs> um, usually I know the answer to the question that I'm asking. Uh, so let me ask you, Mr. Mr. Coucher, um, are you saying that in a highly complicated debt structure like uh, WBS in, in Thames Water, uh, that you have the power to stop dividends going to each of those debt pairs and not only to what 
everybody would normally understand as being the shareholders, the equity shareholders. We have the powers to stop dividends being released from the operating company. So where they go beyond that is a matter of the company. But, but we would, the financial powers that we have got, retain the dividends that would have been paid inside the company if we're not satisfied that um, they are performing and they've not satisfied they have sufficient financial resilience. We didn't have that power before, we do now. And the, and the Southern one is a, is a good case in point working. So Southern, um, Macquarie have gone in there with a group of investors, they've looked at the business, they now realise they now need to inject further equity because of the base and that is what they're doing precisely now. Um, and we are confident that the, uh, the situation that happened at, uh, a decade or so ago is, is uh, now protected. Thank you. So it, what you're saying is had, had these new arrangements been in place uh, when um, our previous witness was the CEO of, of uh, uh, the organisation um, and subsequently, uh, what happened with off what, uh, what happened with Thames Water uh, could not have happened. We would have had the ability to block the dividends going out of the company, yes. Uh, so, uh, I think again it was a question from my colleague Darren Jones um, to her um, when she denied that uh, they had uh, failed in any way or lacked any powers to do so. That is one way in which the debacle could have been present, pre prevented. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, are you confident that going forward, um, no company, no uh, part of the ownership of the company would be able to receive the level of returns that Macquarie was extracting from uh, Thames Water uh, between 15.9 and 19 percent. That's over double the normal uh, return that uh, yeah. regulators. Yeah. So we've set us up with change the license to, to make those, um, sorry, to, to give us the power to do that. But furthermore, we've now got more flexibility with the license. If we think further changes are required, we will introduce them. Great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think Rosie wanted to come over with a supplementary on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm going over some ground covered by Darren Jones and Kat Smith, I'm afraid, but my um, constituents would really like to know, I mean, do you understand why in the coastal town of Whitstable, for example, they don't have a lot of faith in Ofwat or the Environment Agency or anyone else that is supposed to be imposing fines and stopping. You know, we know that you impose these record fines against Southern Water, for example, but nothing has actually practically and physically changed. Every time we get a thimble full of rain, there's sewage released into the sea, which affects every aspect of daily life in a town like Whitstable. Um, can you just maybe you know, can I just give you the chance to kind of briefly explain to them why they should have faith in you, what you can do. I mean, you've talked about improving customer service, revoking licences, stopping shareholders getting dividends, um, and that customers' interests remain protected. Can you convince my constituents that you're doing your job? Let me get this. Um, so the, the issue of stormwater overflows um, is appalling. You know, we have said this, and I have said this to the committee before, um, the reliance, over-reliance and use of stormwater overflows to deal with rainfall, as you suggest, uh, is, is unacceptable. So what we have been, we've been very clear to everybody, that if a company, and this is the same for the Environment Agency, if a company is in breach of its legal or regulatory obligations, they will take action, and they will force compliance, and the companies will be responsible for rectifying the problems. We have got ourselves in a situation where some of these stormwater overflows have, do allow under permits to release sewage into the, into the water systems. Mm. So we need to tighten up all of those permits to say to people that is no longer acceptable. So you might have a permit today, but we need to see that tightened over the course of time. But you know, we will enforce and ensure companies comply with the law, comply with their environmental obligations and their permitting requirements, and the cost of doing so is for the companies themselves. We have got six um, concurrent large-scale investigations into the companies that have been doing this to satisfy ourselves that they are complying with the legal obligations and complying with environmental permits. They are complicated. I don't wish to trivialise it, but we are working through that, um, and uh, we know our colleagues at the EA are doing exactly the same. Okay, thank you. If they're still within those legal limits, though, 
and sewage is still spilling out every time it rains. Who is then responsible for changing that or imposing different legal limits? <coughs> or, I mean, is that us? So you're saying we need to come back and change that, or DEFRA needs to... That's a different environment agency. So it's right. the environment agency that permits each and every storm discharge, and so okay. that's, the, that's the arrangement. Can we just, just refer to the um, uh, DEFRA's water, plan for water, which does set much lower targets, the yes. use of these stormwater flows. It's going to take time, but it's uh, down yes, to... The government has set out a £56 billion plan to address this issue. I've been on site at Whitstable, uh, so there is scope to make uh, quick improvements, which the companies in the process are making, uh, but then there are some quite significant issues which will require investment to address. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay, I think Philip Durham wanted to come in. I'll come in after Neil Hudson's question. Okay, Neil. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to follow up quickly before I get on to my sort of main question about Mr. Couch. You've been before us before, and, and I've asked you about the, the teeth that you have in terms of putting pressure on the water companies, and we've talked about fines and then not allowing dividends to go out. Um, in terms, we've talked about financial performance today, um, and, we, and, and Rosie's been touching on the sort of sewage outflows as well. Do you feel that the teeth you have, um, if water companies are having these unacceptable and immoral sewage discharges into our water courses, do you feel that you have the teeth? And what are those teeth? Would they be with the fines, or can you potentially stop the dividends going out if they are breaching the, the sewage outflows as well? Or is it more financial performance that you're going to be using that particular tooth? Um, uh, I'll ask David to ask his but, but I would just say that, yes, we have got uh, the power to enforce compliance, um, to address any aspect of underperformance through either fines, withholding uh, dividend payments if we think they are in breach of their obligations. But is the underperformance, it could be about sewage rather than financial underperformance? Yep. Yes. 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 Okay. So we have a set of performance commitments. We also have obligations that we enforce on companies in terms of the operation of their uh, sewage systems. Uh, and so that's what we're investigating with our six cases. Uh, we will have the ability to impose uh, financial penalties. We've imposed £250 million of penalties on companies in the last five years. We won't hesitate to use those powers. Uh, I reassure the committee and the public watching this that you will use those teeth to, to hold those water companies to account. Can I just add one extra thing? When I did a paper to you before, who will answer it? Uh, when I appeared to you before, you were asking a very similar question. So, uh, in the last 12 months, what we have done, we've secured additional funding uh, from Treasury and through DEFRA to allow us to ramp up our investigation capabilities, that we are em empowering our people to be much, much more intrusive on, on companies' performance. So, it's a, a more muscular approach that when we see companies not performing, Below where we're expecting, we have had them in and we've said we would like a rectification plan from you. Your performance is not acceptable. Please give us a turnaround plan to rectify that. That is new. We didn't do that before. Uh, and uh, in the first part of this year, we had five companies in to say we are not satisfied. Please give us a, an improvement program. Um, and that's a result of the extra powers that we've, we've secured and extra funds. Sorry, David, I cut across. Yeah, so we, you know, we think we do have the powers. I mean, as noted, there's, there is the role of the Environment Agency in terms of setting permits at sites, uh, but we have the powers, we have the ability to, to impose large financial penalties, up to 10% of turnover on... You've got the powers. Can you just reassure us and the public that you will use yes, those powers? Yes, we are, we are, we are taking, we're taking enforcement action against six large wastewater companies at present, uh, and I know these investigations do take time and people are impatient to see results. I am as well, uh, but we are making good progress uh, and we will have announcements. To come on that. I wanted to move back on to the, the, the topic that we touched on earlier today in terms of staffing and leadership and, and the relationship between the, the regulator and the sector. And, and we've, we know that uh, one of our previous witnesses, the, uh, um, the new interim chief, joint, uh, the joint chief executive, Thames Water, was formerly one of your predecessors, uh, Mr. Black, uh, uh, at Offwatt. Um, do you feel that there are the high numbers of, of senior Offwatt staff moving to potentially higher paid positions in private water companies, do you feel that that is problematic at all for your ability to maintain trust in Offwatt's off role and motives? Firstly, just to reassure, we do all uh, departures from Offwatt are covered by civil service business appointment rules, uh, which does do, do allow us to impose conditions on staff for up to two years after they leave in terms of the work they undertake. 
uh, and how they, uh, uh, so, so that's important. I think the other point I'd make is in terms of contextualizing this. We've, there's been lots of media reports on this issue, but they're talking about numbers which amount to two or three staff members per year leaving off. We're an organization of over 300 people. Uh, each one of the, and a number of those members didn't go from off to a water company, they went off what, to another employer, to a water company. You mentioned these media reports. You recognise the figures of about 27 former off what directors, managers, and consultants who are now currently working with private water companies. Do you recognise those figures? I recognise those figures, but the point I would make is that a number of those people left off what to go to work, at, at, you know, either in another sector or not for a water company, uh, and then later on, some years later, have gone to work for a water company. And so I think it does need to be seen in that context. We do have strict rules about what people do upon leaving off what uh, and so you know I think these numbers uh, are, you know do not support any kind of uh, the contention that that's been made. We recognise that in the public sector there are finite resources in terms of the salaries that can be paid and we understand that. Um, Professor Sadita Helm at, at Oxford University has said there is a merry-go-round between the core regulators and the regulated utilities. Regulators are not paid well and if there is a potential of future jobs in the firms they regulate, it creates potential conflicts of interest. D do, you, do you concur with that statement at all? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't accept. I mean, I work with an incredible bunch of very dedicated people, um, as I say, most of whom do not go to work for water companies. Uh, so, they, uh, so, so I think they do a fantastic job. Uh, they're very dedicated to, to uh, the, the, the public interest, to protecting customers' interests. And it's probably worth noting that Professor Helm also works for these water, water companies and is engaged by them. So, <laughs> I have a question for you. Fair point. Same. Fair point. Um, and, and I do very much take on board what you say that, that, that the people that work for your organisation work so hard to try and do the best to, to, to improve the water quality for our country. But for you, as two leaders of, of that regulator, does it concern you that potential? pull and drag into the private sector that it is draining you of the vital resource that you need to do the best job that you can. Again, just to contextualise that, I think only one member of Offwatt's senior leadership team, which is Catherine Ross, you've seen earlier, has left Offwatt and she didn't go to a water company, she went to BT, but has ultimately ended up in a water company. So, uh, it doesn't worry you then? Uh, so, no, I think, I, I think people... Gotcha. Uh, what do you... It doesn't look good, I accept that. Um, but, you know, I'd like to assure the committee to anybody, you know, we have um, processes and governance regimes to make sure that decisions are, are syndicated, they're taken thoughtfully and considerably, and that no one individual mm -hmm. really has the powers to make uh, decisions which uh, may be biased or whatever it may be. So I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably reassured that the decision-making process we've got um, protects that. Um, but I do accept that on the face of it, people could ask questions, but for David's reasons, it's it, it, it not really an issue. There's a small number of people, they tend to be more junior people, and they tend to end up in the regulatory departments of these big organisations, which tends to be a bit of a specialist skill, so understandably they've got skills, knowledge and capabilities about the process, which is valuable to companies, uh, but I do accept your, your observation. Thank you. Thank you. I think very, very briefly, I'm just following that, that point up, just for the avoidance of doubt and for clarity and reassuring the public. Can you confirm that uh, you, Ian, have no financial interest in a water company or a company which is a major supplier to a water company? I have got no interest at all in any water company, any supplier to the water industry. Thank you. And David, can you give us the same reassurance? Yes, that's right. I have no interest in any water company. Thank you. And for anybody you bring into the company, whether an executive or non-executive into off what rather than the company, you receive a similar assurance? Yes. Yeah, it's very clear upon uh, entering employment at off what you're not allowed to own shares in a water company. Thank you. Thank you. David, you talked about, obviously you produce a financial monitoring report which uh, delves into some of the way these um, companies are, are funded, but you also said that sometimes there were fairly opaque mechanisms. Do you think having more powers to sort of delve into some of these opaque funding streams would help you, or do you feel you've got enough powers at the moment? I think we have adequate powers to require information from companies. Uh, there is a question about the level of resources and expertise required, and so we are looking to um, um, beef up our resources in that space. And so I guess my, uh, my key question is, you know, do we have 
the, the, the resources in that space, and that's why I'm pleased we've got the additional funding to strengthen our capabilities. But it is a, you know, it is a, it is a complex area. It's an area of specialist expertise. Uh, so it's not just about having the information; it's about having the expertise to understand what's going on and to ask the right questions to companies. Thank you. Just following on from um, Neil's point, you, you said only one person has moved from off what to. I, I think the figure we saw was 27. So is it one member of the senior leadership team, which is Catherine Ross? So the 27 people are referred to. Pretty senior. Over the period of time, I think it's about two to three employees a year. Well, we'd had that figure before. Um, sorry, Chair, that, I don't think that's accurate either. Six of the nine uh, companies in England have hired directors of corporate strategy or heads of regulation who previously worked of off what. Um, Andrew Beaver, uh, Northumbrian Water, former Director of Strategy and Planning, Ian McGuffock, now at Southern Water, um, Ross at Thames Water, Jonathan Reid, Director of Regulatory Policy. Yep. There's a so number none of, of those are members of our senior leadership team, just to be clear. Did you have senior leadership positions? They've gone on companies. to senior positions within their company, within the companies that they've joined. Uh, half of the 27 have gone on to senior leadership positions right. in the companies that they've joined. Whilst they're off what they weren't a member of the leadership team there, they were uh, lower down the hierarchy. Mm. Perfect. Well, we're bang on the time I had in the back of my mind for moving on to the final evidence session. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you, David, for coming and giving us such useful evidence. Thank you. Order. Thank you. Order. Thank you very much for your interest. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 Well, thank you and um, welcome to our panel for the second session. Uh, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, starting with the Minister, I think. Good morning, Chair. Um, Rebecca Powell, uh, Environment Minister, uh, also Water Minister, comes under my portfolio. And I'm David Hill. I'm the Director General for the Environment in DEFRA. Perfect. Thank you. If I could start, Minister, with the, the question. We heard how, you know, in the worst scenario, if there was a, a failure, you know, we've been looking at some of the energy companies, the banks, if there was a failure and the water companies had to go into special administration, how concerned you, are you about the potential failure at Thames Water and other providers in the sector? Is it on your radar? Well, as the Water Minister, obviously, uh, I'm looking at all the water companies and working very closely um, to make sure off what are doing their job as the regulator. So they would be highlighting things to us constantly, of course, and we were very um, mindful of their resilience um, report that they came out with um, earlier in the year. Uh, in terms of the special administration order that you're referring to, of course, should a, a water company no longer be able to fulfil its financial obligations, the Secretary of State and Offwater have got powers uh, to apply um, for this uh, on insolvency grounds. But uh, I've been made fully aware, and in fact, the new chairman, uh, Sir Adrian, came in uh, to see the Secretary of State uh, just yesterday, who gave absolute assurances that we are nowhere near that. Uh, that situation. But a government would always have to have the measures in place uh, should they ever be required. Would you agree that they've been skating on dangerously thin ice with 8% gearing and half their debt linked to inflation with inflation rates <coughs> rising? You know, well, obviously, they, they, there's been alarm bells ringing all around, uh, not just Thames Water, but other water companies who are so highly geared and so exposed to debt repayments. Well, obviously, we, we look really closely at this whole issue of debt and gearing uh, and how the whole system works in terms of attracting outside funding, uh, in terms of uh, equity or raising debt, because obviously the water companies have got to pay for all of the investment, the huge investment in infrastructure, 
and let's not forget that since privatisation, investment has actually doubled uh, compared to what it was before privatisation, and it's attracted in £190 billion. Pounds. Well, it's just twos, or maybe, money, maybe not. Yeah, money which... Um, you know, what, what one might say would, we would have struggled to have attracted uh, had we not gone through this process of privatisation. Because if you talk to people, we might call it back in the old days, Robert, <laughs> but I think you and I were around, and I've, I've met with a whole lot of people, actually, um, who, who um, were involved pre-privatisation and then saw the system through and now privatisation for them to reflect on their thoughts on it. You know, and the water system was in a terrible state you know we did have terrible leakage we did we have had masses of interruptions to supply um, and we cut leakage by uh, I think a third we cut supply um, outages by a fifth you know so there's been huge um, improvements so I honestly think we must not forget to tell that story that's not to say there is not an awful lot we have to keep our eye on and we have to make sure our water companies are delivering what we need now you know in also a changing world, I think the, um, the chair of Ofwat referred to that. We've got huge demands on us now because also of climate change and so forth. But the, in terms of the, I think you asked the question about the gearing, uh, well, um, uh, obviously Ofwat did indicate in their financial resilience report that uh, they had some concerns about Thames. That's why... Um, you know, they're working with them very, very closely. But I think, and I'd like to draw uh, the committee's attention to those statements that we've had from Offort and Thames Water. So on the 29th of June, we had a statement that emphasised that Thames Water had a strong liquidity position, which included £4.4 billion of cash and committed funding. And we've just had the Thames Water announcement, haven't we, this week, uh, with the accounts via the annual report that they secured a further that was and they, some money was was committed earlier in the year but we've had a further 750 million pounds of equity that was, investment. That was a shortfall on the billion that was suggested needed to be injected though wasn't it? Yeah but I think they gave some adequate answers I've been listening to you know this is the money that needs to be sp spent soon soon and they need to know that they've got it uh, and the company um, is uh, is, is knows that the shareholders know that um, they'll be seeking another 2.5 billion pounds uh, and they've given a statement of intent of that and actually you asked about the gearing so with this injection of funds it's just dropped to 77.4 so it's coming down um, I have to um, I have to just get this in there chairman that it was actually under the Labour Party uh, in the sort of mid 2000s that this debt, if you look at a graph, started yeah. to go like this in yeah. the water companies. Uh, and it's stabilised under this government. I think what we've been talking about today is the difference between um, raising debt to pay dividends and pay, yeah. raising debt to invest in infrastructure, which are two completely different things. Yeah, well, I think you've had a lot of discussion and answers about that and about, about you know, where the money goes. But equally, um, Thames haven't paid what they call dividends for six years, but they completely admit it's in their accounts um, the that um, the shareholders haven't been paid the dividends, but the money has gone to that, um, that service um, holding committee. And I'll bring David in here if you want more detail on that. I think the question I was going to ask, maybe David could, could come in if necessary, you know, are you prepared for a potential failure? And if so, could you reassure the committee and uh, indeed the taxpayers that this wouldn't be about bailing out the shareholders but about ensuring that service continues to be supplied oh absolutely i think that's a really clear message we have to give customers uh, it, this will not affect customers the whole point if it was ever needed uh, would be and it's not a form of renationalization just to get that actually on the record it's actually it's a tool that's used to ensure that the services can continue uh, and that new owners can be found um, Bulb has been referred to a number of times in the work with um, Desnes. So, um, you know, lessons can be learned from that. Obviously, water companies are different in the way they're structured, uh, but we can give absolute assurances that if necessary, uh, the system is there. But also, I'd really like to assure the committee that we will keep the committee informed uh, uh, as and when and if necessary. But as I said in speaking to the chairman, 
yesterday, we are, we would be. It's not it's not on the cards. We're a long way from that. Uh, there's a lot of work underway already in the Thames uh, to to sort the gearing out and to ensure that um, the the company can continue to deliver the services customers need. Thank you. Did Thank you want to come in? Just add a little to that, uh, Chair. So, uh, as the Minister said, sh should a special administration order ever be needed um, for a water company, the, the, the statutory purpose of the order uh, would be to ensure that customers continue to receive their water and their wastewater services. And that's, that's um, that public interest test is really the reason we have a special administration regime on the statute book in the, in the 1991 Water Industry Act. <coughs> as I think um, David Black was saying earlier, um, uh, in terms of taxpayer liabilities, uh, important to, to note that this is a company, in the case of Thames, with uh, £19 billion pounds worth of assets. So in the first instance, the task of the administrator, if appointed, would be to work with uh, 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 debt holders uh, and uh, the company uh, to protect the interests of the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. On your question about preparedness, obviously we need to keep all of our uh, preparations for a whole range of scenarios up to date and that's what uh, that's what we will do um, but as I think um, Sir Adrian indicated earlier the liquidity statement from the company was important because I think that's the company very clearly signaling that with 4.4 billion pounds of liquidity um, uh, uh, were some way off uh, some of these more uh, uh, some of these more um, uh, uh, some of these scenarios. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julian Sturdy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted, to, Minister, I just wanted to touch on worst case scenarios. So we've already, you've already mentioned that you're, we're some way off this, um, which is good news. But if it was a worst case scenario, how advanced are plans to potentially nationalise Thames Water, and have you estimated any costs of doing that? Well, I'll reiterate, we're nowhere near that. And I, what we don't want to do is, is you know, is scare people. We, we, this is being closely monitored by Thames. They're working incredibly closely uh, with um, Ofwat uh, to steer through this. Uh, and and also, it's not nationalisation. I think you you said that. Um, and and government has the the process. You know, it has the powers if they're needed. Uh, and won't hesitate to use them, of course. Um, and so I think, I'd, you know, I need to give assurances that that is what would happen. Um, you know, we've got, uh, and what would, you know, government, the Secretary of State and off what have the powers to, um, to place a company in sp special administration effectively. Um, and, and the point of it would be that it, so that it could be transferred as a going concern to new owners. Uh, and um, either on insolvency grounds uh, because they were unable to pay their debts, or the other way it would happen would be if it was um, on enforcement um, grounds if they were in ser serious breach of, yeah. um, of, of one of their duties. And I understand all that, and I understand that this is, I'm talking about worst case scenario mm. here, but it's just really what planning has been done if this scenario does come up, um, and also what ability is it to put would it be to pass it on to a another another buyer, basically? And have you looked at those options um, going forward? And, what, and I suppose also, what conversations have you had with Treasury about this as well? I'll bring David in here. Shall I take that? So, um, as I say, we keep all our preparations up to date for a range of scenarios, uh, up to and including special administration, should that ever be required. As I say, it doesn't look. Uh, it doesn't look uh, uh, imminent at this point in time, as I think both the company and the regulator said earlier. We would do all of that work uh, uh, jointly with uh, the Treasury and indeed with um, UKGI um, as well. Um, uh, uh, and so, uh, sh should it be required, um, we would be prepared for that. Um, that said, um, the company has just signed off its accounts uh, uh, and it's returned its various uh, statements to Ofwat, uh, uh, giving assurance, uh, the judgment of the directors that it's a going concern, uh, independently validated by the auditors. Um, the focus now is on the company's uh, business plan 
That's the critical thing that the regulators need to see, is the company bring forward its business plan. I think you heard some Sir Adrian Montague talking about this earlier. The company does need to prioritise as part of its business plan. Um, there are performance issues the company needs to address, and that's the thing I think our principal focus is on for the foreseeable. Okay, but I still haven't really, you still haven't, I, you still haven't given me the confidence that in this worst case scenario that those, those plans are there in the background ready to go. You, so can you confirm that? We have all, we keep all of our preparations up to date, uh, up to and including preparations for a special administration order should we ever need to, to apply to the court for one. Okay, thank you. Last point, if I can share very quickly. Um, in the, some of the previous uh, discussion, um, Thames Water, it was uh, discussed about Thames Water having a, uh, an immediate uh, payoff of around uh, 560 million of their debt in case of a nationalisation. Um, now, they say they don't recognise that clause. I don't, have you, could you put, shed any light on that at all? We saw that earlier exchange. I'm afraid we didn't recognise the figure either. So we will do a bit of, um, we'll check in with uh, the regulator uh, and indeed with the company after this committee. And I think um, the committee committed to write on that point, uh, the company committed to write on that point. Yeah. Could you share okay. that information with us when you, of course, when you get of it? Of course. Thank you. Happy to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ian Byrne. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, England and Wales are international outliers on the level of water industry privatisation since 1989. Privatisation since 1989 to give us £72 billion pounds gone to shareholders. Water companies have built up a debt mountain of £60 billion, used this to finance dividends to shareholders. Our bills have gone up 40% in real time, term since privatisation. The Environmental Agency has said by 2050 some rivers will see 50 to 80 per cent less water during the summer months because of the uh, climate disaster. Water companies are now actually leaking away 2.4 billion litres of water every day. Every day the water companies discharge raw sewage into our rivers and seas over 9 million hours since 2016 and we know the consequences of that. Catastrophically 14 per cent of English rivers are considered to have good ecological status. Not one reservoir has been built since 1989, and nearly 70% of the British public want water back into public ownership. So, would you not agree with the vast majority of the British public that the experiments of privatisation has certainly not saved the best interests of this country at large? Thank you for your list, sir. <laughs> Um, I just want to put something on the record, Chair. Actually, if you take inflation into account, since tw 2020, uh, our water bills have been pretty static. It's 2020? 20, uh, sorry, 2010. 1889. So from 2010 to 11, it, it was uh, £427 pounds on average. And 2020 to 21, it would be £426. Pounds. So I think we have to uh, look at that in perspective. Uh, and take inflation into account. So I think your main question was about privatisation, though. Yes. Um, and I would uh, reiterate that, um, and actually, um, we, you know, England is relatively unusual in terms of its privatisation model it compared is, yeah. to other countries. Um, but actually, the UK invests more per inhabitant than most of our comparable countries. And that does include Germany and France. And actually, we've had increased levels of investment since privatisation, as I said at the beginning, um, which has resulted well, Minister, why in do a 70 lot of benefits. Of the, why do 70 percent of the country who are both, and this isn't ideological, this is, this is a lot of Conservative voters in the same mindset. Why are they so unhappy with the current system? Why do they want it to bring back into public ownership? In, in terms of um, any, uh, dis, um, you know, errors that water companies have made, I've made it absolutely clear many, many times at Stanley at the dispatch box that they need to be held to account. For example, whether it's the uh, use of their storm sewage overflows way above what their permits allow. That's why we brought in the storm sewage overflow reduction plan. That's why we've asked every single company to produce a plan for all of their storm, the relevant storm sewage overflows. They are now with our department. They have already come in. But I think you know, it has to be said, since privatisation, we've attracted £190 billion. Pounds. That's about £5 billion a year, which arguably would have been very, very Why hard to get. Why have you got such record levels of dissatisfaction? 
Why well, are so many people so angry about what's happening in their well, communities? We want, we want satisfaction as well, don't we? And, and I think we also, and I would be the first to say, water companies have to get their house in order, and that's why we're coming down so hard on them, but also why we have put so much in the Environment Act, why we've got our integrated plan for water, why we had our storm sewage overflows reduction plan, and why we've got all our targets that they're going to have to deliver on. But I think we do also have to say that um, we've had some successes under privatisation. Leakage has been cut by a third. Um, outages have been cut by a fifth. And I'm not defending any of the recent outages we've had from some water companies. They have to get their house in order. Uh, and, and they are. Um, and, and that's what Ofwat has to do, and that's what we have to oversee. Um, and I think we have to demonstrate to the public uh, that a lot of good is being done uh, for water, and water is the most critical thing going forward. That's why we brought out our integrated plan for water, and why, as a government, we have actually we're backing it all up with legislation and, indeed, enforcement and um, higher penalties and so forth. Maybe we have to take the ideological state jacket off and look at alternative models of ownership, because many would say it's been a catastrophic decision to to leave a public good in a, at the mercy of the market, something which actually sustains life. So if we looked at alternative models of ownership and government, such as those in the Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish waters. Well, well, obviously, it's really sensible to learn from other people. But in terms of um, Scotland, I think David will back me here, up here. So in, our, uh, in England, we're now monitoring, and it's this government that's brought in all the monitoring. That's why we really know what's happening. This happened under the Conservative government, not the previous yeah. Labour government. I think it was 4% of storm sewage overflows monitoring when we took over. Now it's 93%, and it will be 100% by the end of the year. Now in Scotland, uh, they actually only monitor 4% of their storm sewage overflows and in Wales uh, I believe I'm right and we can send you the stats chair uh, their um, uh, illegal use basically of storm sewage overflows is much higher than it is in England I think David you might be able to back me up we're in danger stats. of straying into quite an ideological yeah. debate which yeah. you know this particularly it's looking at the issue of Thames water right. the problems they face at the moment so I understand that I think probably the next general election will be a good opportunity to exercise yeah. these issues Ian so, okay, so can we move on to uh, Derek Thomas? Thank you very much. Um, so actually, I'm sadly picking up from that. And it is, you're right about the monitoring. The reason people might be dissatisfied is because actually we have provided some very transparent information about what's actually going on and then how we fix it. So I completely get that we've engaged with the consumers, told them, customers told them what uh, is expected and that's why they're um, much more aware of what's going on. Um, but the concern I've got is that much of the water industry is owned by overseas financial investors. I wonder if you think, uh, with that responsibility in your portfolio, portfolio, whether actually that's a, an acceptable thing to have for the UK customer, and whether there should be stricter ownership criteria. Um, yes, thank you, thank you for, um, for that. And yes, we, we do have a lot of overseas investment, but I think in a way that's one of the strengths of the system, despite all of the conversations that have been going on, we've still continued to attract uh, a great deal of overseas investment. And we need to attract in overseas investment uh, so that we've got the funding that we require. Obviously, um, a strict eye needs to be kept uh, on, uh, on that and where, it's, where it is coming from. Um, um, but we do actually, uh, just to give reassurances, we do have a power to intervene um, in investments uh, through the um, National Security Investment Act. And indeed, we would have the power to block an investment if it was deemed necessary. David might want to add to that. Uh, that's certainly true on uh, national security grounds uh, yeah. under, under the Act, to be familiar to Mr Jones. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think the other point to make in terms of um, uh, foreign investment is there's no differentiation in terms of Ofwat's ability to regulate and take enforcement action, whether the investor is a domestic investor or an overseas investor. Mm. So Ofwat will regulate, as it were, sort of blind to the provenance of the, the investment and will go through a process of, 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 of testing uh, 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 in dialogue with, with prospective investors, uh, any acquisitions. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so we heard a lot of them how much you caught of the role of Macquarie earlier on in the session. Um, and given the issues caused by Macquarie's ownership of Thames Water, should we have concerns about the ownership of Southern Water and other in essential infrastructure, such as gas di distribution infrastructure in the UK by that company? Um, yes, I, did. Well, I overheard a bit of it. We were just waiting outside the door at that bit. But, um, you know, I suppose, I suppose we, you know, I would reiterate that we are still continuing to attract this overseas capital, which we really need. Um, and we do have the powers, you know, to intervene if necessary. Um, and um, and there's been very close oversight of Macquarie and its involvement with Southern. Uh, Southern itself, you know, is it's it's actually doing uh, the right, the sort of self-monitoring it actually needs to do. It's just put a stop on paying out any dividends uh, as a result of one of the recent credit ratings that didn't come from Offort, that didn't come from us. You know, they did their board did that. Uh, themselves, um, and, um, and, and you know, if the, and if there were concerns, this is why off what had got this very clear oversight. Why they've really ramped up their um, monitoring uh, and their um, their assessments of financial resilience, uh, and why we put new powers in the Environment Act, you know, which they wanted, uh, so that they can change licences and in fact uh, what happened with that changeover at Southern of course was there was an opportunity with a new company coming in to change the licence uh, so uh, so that they can uh, get these resilience measures firmly embedded and for example you know dividends now cannot be paid if there's any issue about financial and um, the credit rating or environmental performance and in fact that all backs up what we said to Offwat in our strategic policy statements, which we give to Offwat, and they have to act in accordance with it. If I, if I may just just sort of briefly build on that answer, I mean, I think the important change that the Environment Act brought in is that whilst previously Offwat could vary license conditions, it had to be done with the agreement of the company. And what the Act does is it strengthens it so Offwat can now impose license conditions. On mm -hmm. the company, and two other, and two of the sort of first uses of, of those powers are one, uh, as I think of what we were explaining earlier, um, uh, preventing money flowing out of the regulated company in circumstances where the credit rating of the regulated company uh, uh, is reduced, and two, much more explicit enforcement of a linkage between dividend payment and and performance, mm -hmm. and so that's that is a distinct shift with more. Uh, legal backing for off what compared to when um, uh, Macquarie first entered yeah. the sector. And also, um, Treasury have just uh, agreed that off what um, have basically got another £11.3 million for enforcement. So that's going to go on more monitoring, more reporting, this, you know, much, uh, much more <coughs> forensic oversight. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'll leave it there because I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Um, I think your office indicates you need to be away at half past 12, but if you're not catching a train, could we prevail upon you for a little bit longer? Oh, that would mean I'd be half past 11, hour. sorry, half past 11. <laughs> half past 11, sorry, half past 11. Can we prevail upon you for a little bit? We will we'll do our best, Chair. If, if short answers would probably help in that regard as well. Darren, just a yeah, short, short question for me on that, on that basis. The UK is about to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, um, where companies from those member countries can sue the British government in a private interstate dispute settlement scheme uh, for loss of expected earnings because of the actions of the British government. Canada and Australia are both members of CPTPP. If we end up in an environment where the government has to take action on Thames Water, for example, and the Canadian shareholder loses out, could they bring action against the British government to recover that amount? And has that legal risk assessment been done as part of your planning? Well, let me, I think I should take it away and give you a fuller response. <laughs> but of course, the decision for the decision to enter an administration yeah. and less rests with the court. So the government, the Secretary of State, or off what with the consent of the Secretary of State would apply to the court. So in those circumstances, it would be the court making administration order. So I will talk to my lawyers, but um, in effect they would be seeking to bring action against a, a, a court order.
You could write to us with your assessment. That'd yep. be helpful. Happy to. Don't know the answer, which is why I'm asking. Yes, I think some lawyers could get quite rich mm. on, on this particular point. No, Barry had a very no, good no, point. Just following up on, on the issue of uh, foreign investors, uh, yesterday uh, the Deputy Prime Minister identified China as the top security concern. Now, you have uh, said today that it's a good thing that we have foreign investors in, our, in Thames Water, but of course the Chinese Investment Corporation owns 8.7 per cent of that. Do you think that that's a good thing, or is it something that the Deputy Prime Minister should be concerned about? I'll just refer you back to my previous answer. Uh, if there were any concerns, um, th there are powers to intervene, to block investment, and we do have the National Security Investment Act, and we you know, could act accordingly with that. So I'll, unless David wants to say any more, I think I'll leave it at that. I don't think there's any more we can say here about that. No. Thank you. Um, yeah. Neil Hudson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Today we've been looking at, at, at the, the uh, example of Thames Water, but also as its broader implications for the resilience of the, the water sector across the country. Now, the government has said that, that through what's going on with Thames, there is no risk of water bills going up. But given that huge infrastructure investment is required, do, do you feel that that position uh, can hold? Can you reassure the public that, that bills will not be affected? Well. As he will know, bills are capped until 2025 anyway. Uh, there's no expectation that bills will be rising in the short term. Uh, they actually are subject to inflation. That's completely separate from what's happening to the uh, water companies. But in terms of any potential um, rises to, to bills, that will all come out in the wash once... Uh, off what have gone through all of the the business plans for the water companies. So, um, and and you know you know how they work. They they look at what uh, water companies are required to deliver, what expectations we have, a government have put on them through our targets and through the public's expectations. In fairness, uh, the huge investment that will have have to um, happen in future, um, and uh, and then. Uh, decisions will be made but I would really add that we're always mindful of the effect on uh, consumers. Uh, we do have a sound system for um, looking after the vulnerable and we have our water shore system. I think already 1.3 million people have been helped through that. Uh, so that is always there, that our social tariffs, uh, payment holidays and so forth uh, and will continue to be there. Um, and. Uh, and indeed, you know, we will we will consider considerations will be made uh, about whether there might be some um, impact on customer mills, but we can't say what that will be yet. Broadly, you feel that that hopefully the the five yearly water bill review the, these events shouldn't buffet them too significantly. Well, well, also, the whole reason why we have the debt and the equity, of course, is to get the big cash injection in to build the infrastructure as fast as we can uh, within the limits of, you know, have we got the people available to build the stuff uh, in particular, uh, have we got the materials, but also so you don't get sudden impacts on bill payers, uh, and it's always got to be smoothed out. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it wouldn't be wrong to say that, of course, Thames Tideway Tunnel, you know, that has been factored into bills. That was all completely understood by the people of London, uh, and I, it, that's due to open next year. Um, and that's the way that's worked. And that's a completely separate private partnership and um, private-public partnership. And separate to that, the government has announced uh, very welcome that, that there will be potentially unlimited fines on water companies that, that don't um, play according to the rules and are and, 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 and not fulfilling their, their, their capabilities. Can you give reassurances that if those fines are enacted, and, and we welcome that, that those teeth are now being given to the regulators and the enforcing agencies, can you give reassurance to the public that that will not have any effect on, on water bills? Or the fines? If, if, if we... No, well, the fines have got to come out of, you know, from shareholders, and no money will, should ever come from customers to pay for these um, fines. So they should have no effect uh, on customers' no, bills? No, and... Uh, you know, we, we've also um, set up our water restoration fund so that money from fines go into that. That money will go back into the environment. And, uh, you know, we, I think you are referring to our announcement that we've just made about the um, variable monetary um, penalties. 
Um, shall I talk about that now, Chair? If you want to briefly give, give it a plug, I thought it <laughs> was announced. very exciting. Is it coincidentally it was announced just and before this? Well, you know, Chair, that we've been working on this, and indeed, um, Mr. the Right Honourable uh, Philip Dunn is, has worked very hard uh, on this particular issue, uh, as have many others, to see if we could, the current limits, you know, on the cap for. Um, Civil penalty penalties is two hundred fifty thousand uh, pounds. Today we've announced that will be unlimited, and um, that's for uh, people contravening their permits, and it's you know will be used as and when appropriate. But you can still there will still be obviously criminal opportunity to go to the criminal court. But if appropriate, these civil penalties can be used. Thank you. I think Alan wanted to come in briefly on the back of that question. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I should say I, I work for Scottish Water, so just to put that on record, the Minister referred to Scottish Water and a, about private investment being the way forward, but it's worth pointing out Scottish Water has invested 35% more per head on average since privatisation compared to England, and the bills are lower, so the investment can be done through the public body. But just to ask the Minister, do you believe in the polluter pays principle? The polluter pays principle. Yes. Yeah, and I think I would take issue potentially on some of the Scottish stats. So I think, Chair, we'd need to just look at those because uh, I did give the stat about yeah, I'm, the. I'm quite uh, confident on the, these. Uh, but, so if we move on, I'm, I'm very the confident on these. But if we move on, the polluter, <laughs> for, for move on the polluter pays principle, yeah. um, in England and Wales, there's still a right to connect off housing developers. Last year, something like 200,000 200, houses were built in England and Wales connected the sewer system. If they cause any overloading of the sewer system, cause any additional overflow discharges, then it falls on the water companies and the bill payers to upgrade the sewers. So in effect that's not that, that's the opposite of the polluter pays principle. Water bill payers in England and Wales are paying a subsidy to housing developers because normal practice would be the housing developers have to pay for upgrades for the sewer before the houses are constructed. So why is the government not changing uh, that? I would refer him to our integrated plan for water, <coughs> where we cover this specifically in terms that all new houses have well to have uh, separate connections. Uh, and I would also uh, refer him to the work we're doing with the Duluc department uh, and the housing um, industry uh, to separate out these systems. It's not well yet, is that correct? It's not into practice yet? Uh, well, it, many new developments already do it. Uh, but you know, going forward, mandatory. this will be what will well, happen. A new, and it, 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 a new housing developer can come along, connect 5,000 houses to the sewer, and it's not mandatory to do sustainable urban drainage, and it's not mandatory for them to do well, the sewer will upgrades. Be. When? It will be, and we will give you chapter and verse, Chairman, uh, to get in, into the detail. Until, until then, the bill payers are subsidising housing developers, isn't that the case? Uh, no, I've, I've answered the question. We, you know, this is being addressed. Uh, we got, you know, hundreds of thousands of Victorian houses in this country, uh, and uh, that's one of the problems. Uh, that's why we have storm sewage overflows, is because of this system, and that they had to be uh, an extra emergency fail-safe measure. We're addressing all this now, uh, and, and, uh, and, and it by new houses and being it connected be without doing. I think we probably Thank need to move on. Of course, it's the existing housing stock that caused the problem with stormwater outflows. New housing has separate yeah. top waters, so exactly. it uses sewage, but it doesn't inundate the system. Right. We're also putting in sustainable urban drainage, which will also address the problem he is Philip, last, uh, addressing. Yeah. Last question, Philip. Thank you, Chairman. So just following up uh, Neil Hudson's comments about the regulator and the licensing regime, um, we've, we heard from Ofwat earlier uh, that they are uh, part of the investi they are investigating Thames water permit breaches mm. over alongside the Environment Agency, over 2,000 of them. That was something that was initiated in response to a report from the Environmental Audit Committee on the one hand and the new Office of Environmental Protection focused on water issues. It was not stimulated by uh, their own action and, and recognition of problems. Do you believe that the powers that they've now got that you've just been referring to and the extra resource you've just been referring to uh, will allow uh, the Environment Agency and Ofwat to do their job properly and uh, investigate permit breaches as a matter of routine course rather than prompted to do so by parliamentary and other interaction? Well, obviously, we want them to be fully functioning, enforcing. We want clean water. I've said all the way along the line that you know, sewage in rivers is unacceptable. 
uh, you know, some of the stats we've had for water companies are unacceptable, and that's why uh, we've been tightening step by step by step uh, the regulator's powers, uh, why we brought forward those measures in the Environment Act, uh, which will enable licences to be um, much more uh, altered, uh, so that dividends cannot be paid out if there's any environmental damage or if there's a financial um, issue with the credit rating. Uh, but it's also why um, Offward have now got this extra 11.3 million on the um, enforcement. It's why we've um, introduced these variable monetary penalties that are uncapped. Um, and it's also, in fairness, it's because of the monitoring we're doing as a government that all of this has actually come to light. I, I know that the EAC did a lot of really useful work, if I'm honest, and this committee in, you know, in, 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 in helping gather the evidence for lots of these things. But it's the monitoring that's bringing it all to light. Uh, and it was actually um, our monitoring that showed that lots of these water companies were breaching their permits and actually some of them they did put their hands up and say we admit we are using our storm sewage overflows too much mm, and that's that, true then. we've got this huge investigation that's been underway and uh, we're wading through all of those and people will be taken held to account you know if they are responsible so the outcomes from those investigations will be subject to this now new as you just said uncapped Fining regime, is well, that right? Uh, people with permits, uh, that, that, that comes under the permitting regime. But breaches. Uh, but, they, but they could, th there are two uh, courses, the civil penalties, which will be quicker uh, to operate, but there is still the recourse to go to the court. If I might. Yeah, David. The, um, the EA investigation into um, uh, potential permit breaches at wastewater treatment works is a criminal investigation, so wouldn't be subject to today's announcement, which is um, essentially giving them more uh, more tools in relation to civil it's sanctions. Yeah. But for the most egregious uh, 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 cases, uh, there's still the criminal route, and that's that's the route they've gone down for this. The civil sanction can be applied for by the Environment Agency and off what, or, or just the Environment Agency? It's, these are yes. Environment Agency and Natural and England, England powers, England. so it's powers for the environmental regulators. And that would apply, for example, where a campaign group identified a problem, drew, drew it to the attention of either Natural England or the Environment Agency, and then mm -hmm. instead of being treated as a routine uh, expense for doing business, which is how water companies have been operating, there will be a scale of fines. Are you, in, in, are you providing advice on the level of fine for the level of severity of problem, but, or is that going to well, be up to the EA? You've highlighted a very good, a very good point in that um, the system was slow, you know, before if you had to go to court. Obviously, it's all based on evidence that, you know, whichever, whichever method you use, uh, but this could be more flexible and quicker, providing you've got the evidence uh, to actually hold someone to account so that the police are does pay, uh, and obviously there will be there will be um, uh, you know guidance on, on these tools. So, there, so just two points, if I may, just to supplement that. Well, one is there are sentencing council guidelines as a reference point for, for for the environment agency or indeed any other environmental regulator, and then just on a point of clarification, the uh, the cap lifted today doesn't just relate to water companies, no. it relates to any operator within scope of the environmental permitting regulations. So actually, waste, uh, waste. and other, mm. other potential sort of, um, um, mis malpractice could be caught by that. Excellent. Final question, if I may, Chairman. So the Water Restoration Fund, which I welcome uh, without reservation, I think is an excellent way of ensuring that some of the issues that Alan was raising, that the funds raised from fines does go into mm. resolving the issue is not necessarily the immediate issue, but improving water quality in the area. Can you give us any more um, indication of how that will work? And does that, that presumably only applies in relation to fines on from arising out of water pollution? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the uh, the criteria you know being worked on now about exactly you know what would be most helpful for the water uh, this fund to go into, but obviously it's going to improving the environment. Uh, and we've got a big emphasis on catchments now through everything we're doing through the integrated plan for water uh, and because really we need to work at a catchment level if we're really going to you know have the cleanest most wonderful water and uh, ecologically healthy rivers we need to work right the way up the catchment so there'll be a focus on it going into um, things mm -hmm. like catchment uh, mm -hmm. restoration and there are already some great projects chair but you know, many more of those. Uh, this would be a good use 
uh, for the money. Determined by DEFRA. But there will be other other um, you know, uh, categories um, uh, that are being uh, looked at right now to make sure that the money is channeled to the most useful place to have the quickest impact as well and um, potentially to be used in the area where it was raised, where, where the money came from. Well, uh, sorry, I said it was the last question, so it's, it's supplementary last, last. to the last question. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, will, will there be some guidance coming out of DEFRA as to how these will be deployed? They will. And we've actually, we've actually sought lots of views on this, so we've been talking to lots of different organisations and groups about where they think the best use of the money would be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we'll draw stumps now, if we may. Could I thank uh, Mr Hill and the Minister for your time? Could I also thank uh, our colleagues from the Business and Energy Committee and the Environmental Audit Select Committee for their cameo roles th this morning? <laughs> and uh, order, order. Indeed. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.